Good evening, and welcome to week 38 of Plague Spear and Company. Tonight, we're pleased to bring you one of Shakespeare's plays, which he co-wrote, a collaboration with John Fletcher, The Two Noble Kinsmen. Based on the Knight's Tale in Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, this play is believed to have been William Shakespeare's final play before he retired to Stratford-upon-Avon and died three years later. So grab your popcorn and a tasty beverage, watch out, sit back, relax, and enjoy Two Noble Kinsmen. New plays and maiden heads are near akin. Much followed both, for both much money again if they stand sound and well. And a good play, as modest scenes blush on his marriage day and shake to lose his honor, is like her that after holy tie and first night stir, yet still is modesty, and still retains more of the maid to sight than husband's pains. And pray our play may be so, for I am sure it has a noble breeder and a pure, a learned, and a poet never went more famous yet to expo in Silver Trent. Chaucer, of all admired the story gifts, there constant to eternity it lives. We let fall the nobleness of this, and the first sound this child here be a hiss. How will it shake the bones of that good man and make him cry from underground? Oh, fan from me the witless chaff of such a writer. The blasts my bays and my famed works makes lighter than Robin Hood. This is the fear we bring. For to say truth, it were an endless thing and too ambitious to aspire to him. Weak as we are and almost breathless swim in this deep water. Do but you hold out your helping hands. We shall tack about and something do to save us. You shall hear scenes though below his art may yet appear worth two hours travail. To his bones, sweet sleep, content to you. If this play do not keep a little dull time from us, we perceive our losses fall so thick we must needs leave. Enter Hymen with the torch burning. A girl in a white robe before singing and strewing flowers. After Hymen, a nymph encompassed in her tresses, bearing a wheaten garland. Then Theseus between two other nymphs with wheaten chaplets on their heads. Then Hippolyta, the bride, led by Pyrithous, and another holding a garland over her head, her tresses likewise hanging. After her, Amelia holding up her train. Artesius and attendants. Roses, their sharp spines being gone, not royal in their smells alone, but in their hue. Made in pinks of odor faint, daisies smell as yet most quaint and sweet time true. Primrose, firstborn child of her, merry springtime's harbinger with her bells dim. Oxlips in their cradles growing, marigolds on deathbeds blowing. Mark heels trim, all dear nature's children sweet, lie for bride and bridegroom's feet. Blessing their sense, not an angel of air, birds melodious or birds fair, is absent hence. The crow, the slanderous cuckoo, nor the bloody boding raven, nor chaff whore, nor chattering pie may on our bright house perch or sing, or with them any discord bring, but from it fly. Enter three queens in black with veils stained with imperial crowns. The first queen falls down at the foot of Theseus. The second falls down at the foot of Hippolyta. And the third before Amelia. 
For pity's sake and true gentilities, hear and respect me. For your mother's sake, and as you wish your womb may thrive with fair ones, hear and respect me. Now for the love of him whom Jove hath marked to honor of your bed, and for the sake of clear virginity, be advocate for us and our distresses. This good deed shall raise you out of the book of trespasses. All you are set down there. Sad lady, rise. Stand up. No knees to me. What woman I may stead that is distressed does bind me to her. What's your request? Deliver you for all. We are three queens whose sovereigns fell before the wrath of cruel Crayon, who endured the beaks of ravens, talents of the kites, and pecks of crows in the foul fields of Thebes. He will not suffer us to bum their bones, to earn their ashes, nor to take the offense of mortal loathsomeness from the blessed eye of holy Phoebus, but infects the winds with stench of our slain lords. Oh, pity, Duke, thou perjure of the earth, draw feared draw thy feared sword that does good turns to the world. Give us the bones of our dead kings that we may chapel them. And of thy boundless goodness, take some note that for the crowned heads that we have no roof, save this, which is the lions and the bears and vaults to everything. I pray you, kneel not. I was transported with your speech and suffered your knees to wrong themselves. I have heard the fortunes of your dead lords, which gives me such lamenting as wakes my vengeance and revenge for him. King Caponius was your lord. The day that he should marry you at such a season as now it is with me, I met your groom by Mars' altar. You were that time fair, not Juno's, Juno's mantle fairer than your tresses, nor in more bounty spread her. Your wheaten wreath was then nor threshed nor blasted. Fortune, at you dimpled her cheeks with smiles. Hercules, our kinsman, then weaker than your eyes, laid by his club. He tumbled down his Nemean hide and swore his sinews thawed. Oh, grief and time, fearful consumers, you will all devour. No, oh, I hope some god, some god hath put his mercy in your manhood, wherefore he'll infuse power and press you forth our undertaker. Oh, no knees, none, widow. Unto the helmeted Bologna use them, and pray for me, your soldier. Troubled I am. Honored oh, Hippolyta, most dreaded Amazonian, that has slain the scythe-tusked boar, not with thy arm as strong as it is white, was near to make the male to thy sex captive, that this thy lord, born to uphold creation in that honor first nature styled it in, shrunk thee into the bound thou wast o'erflowing at once subduing thy force and thy affection. Soldress, but equally canst poise sternness with pity. Now I know hast much more power on him than ever he had on thee, who owest his strength and his love too, who is a servant for the tenor of thy speech, dear glass of ladies. Bid him that we, in flaming war doth scorch under the shadow of his sword, may cool us. Require him, he advance it o'er our heads, speak it in a woman's key. Like such a woman as any of us three, weep ere you fail, lend us a knee. But touch the ground for us no longer time than a dove's motion when the head's plucked off. Tell him, if he in the blood-sized field lay swollen, showing the sun his teeth, grinning at the moon, what you would do. Poor lady, say no more. I had as lief traced this good action with you as that whereto I am going, and never yet went I so willing way. My lord is taken heart deep with your distress. Let him consider. I'll speak anon. Oh, my petition was set down in ice, which by hot grief uncandied melts into drops. So sorrow wanting a form is pressed with deeper matter. Pray stand up. Your grief is written in your cheek. Oh, woe, you cannot read it there. There, through my tears like wrinkled pebbles in a glassy stream, you may behold him. Lady, lady, alack, he that will all the treasure know of the earth must know the center too. He that will fish for my least minnow, let him lead his line to catch one at my heart. Oh, pardon me, extremity that sharpens sundry wits makes me a fool. Pray, you say nothing, pray you. 
Who cannot feel nor see the rain being in it, knows neither wet nor dry. If that you were the ground piece of some painter, I would buy you to instruct me against a capital grief indeed, such a heart pierced demonstration. But alas, being a natural sister of our sex, your sorrow beats so ardently upon me that it shall make a counter reflect against my brother's heart and warm it to some pity, though it were made of stone. Pray, have good comfort. Forward to the temple. Leave not out a jot of the sacred ceremony. Oh, this celebration will long last and be more costly than your suppliance war. Remember that your fame knolls in the ear of the world. What you do quickly is not done rashly. Your first thought is more than others' labored meditants. You're premeditating more than their actions. But, oh, Jove, your actions soon as they move, as ospreys do the fish subdue before they touch. Think, dear Duke, think what beds our slain kings have. Grief are beds that our dear lords have none. None fit for the dead. Those that with cords, knives, drams, precipitants, weary of this world's light, have to themselves been death's most horrid agents. Humane grace affords them dust and shadow. But our lords lie blistering for the visitating sun, and were good kings when living. It's true. And I will give you comfort to give your dead lords graves. The which to do must make some work with Creon. And that work presents itself to the doing. Now twill take form, the heats are gone tomorrow, then bootless toil must recompense itself with its own sweat. Now he's secure, not dreams we stand before your puissance, wrenching our holy begging in our eyes to make petition clear. Tomorrow you may take him drunk with his victory. And his army full of bread and sloth. Artesius, that best knowest how to draw out fit to this enterprise, the primes for this proceeding and the number to carry such a business forth and levy our worthiest instruments, whilst we dispatch this grand act of our life, this daring deed of fate in wedlock. Dowagers take hands. Let us be widows to our woes. Delay commends us to a famishing hope. Farewell. Unseasonably. But when could grief call forth as unpanged judgment can? It is time for best solicitation. Why, good ladies, this is a service whereto I am going greater than any war. It more imports me than all the actions that I have foregone or futurely can hope, can cope. The more, pro the more proclaiming our suit shall be neglected, when her arms, able to lock Jove from a synod, shall by warranting moonlight corslet be. Oh, when her twinning cherries shall their sweetness fall upon thy tasteful lips. What wilt thou think of rotten kings or blubbered queens? What care for what thou feelst not? What thou feelst being able to make Mars spurn his drum? Oh, if thou couch but one night with her, every hour in it will take hostage of thee for a hundred, and thou shalt remember nothing more than what thou banquet bids thee to. <laughs> thou, though much unlike you should be so transported, as much sorry I should be such a suitor. Yet I think, did I not, by the abstaining, abstaining of my joy, which breeds a deeper longing, cure their surfeit that craves a present medicine, I should pluck all ladies' scandal on me. Therefore, sir, as I shall here make trial of my prayers, either presuming them to have some force or sentencing for a their vigor dumb, prorogue this business we are going about and hang your shield afore your heart about that neck which is my fee in which I freely lend to do these Poor queen's service. Oh, help, oh, now. help now. Our cause, Our cause cries, cries for you, Nini. Me. If you grant not my sister her petition, in that force with my celerity and nature which she makes it in, from henceforth I'll not dare to ask you anything, nor be so hardy ever to take a husband. Pray stand up. I am entreating of myself to do that which you kneel to have me. Pirithous, lead on the bride. Get you and pray the gods for success and return. Omit not anything in the pretended celebration. Queens, follow your soldier. 
As before, hence you, and at the banks of Aulus meet with the forces you can raise, where we shall find the moiety of a number for our business more bigger looked. Sure. Since that our theme is haste, I stamp this kiss upon thy current lip. Sweet. Keep it as my token. Set you forward, for I will see you gone. Farewell, my beauteous sister. Erythous, keep the feast full. Bait not an hour on't. Sir, I'll follow you at heels. The feast solemnity shall want till your return. Cousin, I charge you budge not from Athens. We shall be returning ere you can end this feast, of which I pray you make no abatement. Once more, farewell all. Thou dost thou make still good the tongue of the world. It's to deity equal with Mars. It's not above him, for thou being but mortal, makest affections bend to godlike honours. They themselves, some say, groan under such a mastery. As we are men, thus should we do, being centrally subdued. We lose our human title. Good cheer, ladies. Now we turn towards your comforts. Dear Palamon, dearer in love than blood, and our prime cousin, yet unhardened in the crimes of nature, let us leave the city Thebes and the temptings in it before we further sully our gloss of youth. And here to keep in abstinence, we shame as in incontinence, for not to swim in the aid of the current, we're almost to sink, at least to frustrate striving. And to follow the common stream twould bring us to an eddy where we should turn or drown if labor through our gain but life and weakness. Your advice is cried up with example. What strange ruins since we first went to school may we perceive walking in Thebes, scars and bare weeds, the gain of the martialist who did propound to his bold ends honor and golden ingots well, which through he won, he had not, and now flirted by peace for whom he fought, who then shall offer to Mars so scorned altar. I do bleed when such I meet and wish great Juno would resume her ancient fit of jealousy to get the soldier's work that peace might purge for her repletion and retain anew her charitable heart, now hard and harsher than strife or war could be. Are you not out? Meet you no ruin but the soldier in the cranks and turns of Thebes? You did begin as if you met decays of many kinds. Perceive you none that do arouse your pity but the unconsidered soldier? Yes, I pity decays where'er I find them, but such most that sweating and honorable toil are, are paid with ice to cool them. Tis not this I did begin to speak of. This is virtue of no respect in Thebes. I spake of Thebes, how dangerous, if we will keep our honors, it is for our residing. Where every evil hath a good color, where every seeming good's a certain evil, where not to be even jump as they are, here were to be strangers and such things to be uh, mere monsters. Tis in our power unless we fear that apes can tutors to be masters of our manners. What need I affect another's gait, which is not catching where there is faith or to be fond upon another's way of speech when mine own I may reasonably concede, save to speaking it truly. Why am I bound by any generous bond to follow him, follows his tailor happily so long until the followed make pursuit or let me know why mine own barber is unblessed with him, my poor chin too, for that is not scissor just to such a favorite's, favorite's glass. What cannon is there that does command my rapier from my hip to dangle it in my hand or to go tiptoe before the street be foul? Either I am the four horse in the team or I am none that draw to the sequence trace. These poor slight sores need not a plantain, that which rips my bosom almost to the heart. Uh, our uncle Creon. He, <laughs> a most unbounded tyrant, whose successes makes heaven unfeared, and villainy assured beyond its power there's nothing, almost puts faith in a fever, 
and defies a lone voluble chance who only at attributes the faculties of other instruments to his own nerves and act, commands men's service and what they win in it, boot and glory, one that fears not to do harm, good dares not. Let the blood of mine that's said to him be sucked from me with leeches. Let them break and fall off me with that corruption. Clear spirited cousin, let's leave his court that we may nothing share of his loud infamy for our milk will relish of the pasture and we must be vile or disobedient, not his kinsmen in blood in less in quality. Nothing truer. I think the echoes of his shames have deafened the ears of heavenly justice. Widows' cries descend again into their throats and have not due audience of the gods. Oh, Valerius. The king calls for you, yet be laden footed till his great rage be off him. Phoebus, when he broke his whip stock and exclaimed against the horses of the sun, but whispered to the loudness of his fury. <laughs> so a small wind shake him, but what's the matter? Theseus, who were he threat of Paul's, hath sent deadly defiance to him and pronounces ruin to Thebes, who had his hand to seal the promise of his wrath. Let him approach. But that we fear the gods in him, he brings not a jot of terror to us. Yet what man thirds his own worth, the case is each of ours, when his actions dragged with mind assured, tis bad he goes about. Leave that unreasoned. Our services stand now for Thebes, not Creon. Yet to be neutral to him were dishonor, rebellious to oppose. Therefore we must with him stand to the mercy of our fate, who hath bounded our last minute. So we must. Is it said this war's afoot, or it shall be on fail of some condition? Uh, tis in motion. The intelligence of state came in the instant with the defire. Uh, well, let's to the king, who were he a uh, quarter carrier of that honor, which his enemy come in, the blood we venture should be as for our health, which were not spent, rather laid out for purchase. But alas, our hands advance before our hearts. What will the fall of the stroke do damage? Let the event that never erring arbiter tell us when we know all ourselves and let us follow the beckoning of our chance. No further. Sir, farewell. Repeat my wishes to our great Lord, of whose success I dare not make any timorous question, yet I wish him excess and overflow of power, and might be to dure ill-dealing fortune. Speed to him. Store never hurts good governors. Though I know his ocean needs not my poor drops, they, they must yield their tribute there. My precious maid those best affections that heaven infuse in their best tempered pieces keep enthroned in your dear heart. Thanks, sir. Remember me to our all royal brother for whose speed the great Bellana I'll solicit. And since in our terrene state petitions are not without gifts understood, I'll offer to her what I shall be advised she likes. Our hearts are in his army, in his tent. In his bosom, we have been soldiers. And we cannot weep when our friends don their helms or put to sea, or tell of babes broached on the lance, or women that have sawed their infants in and after eat them, the brine they wept at killing him. Then if you stay to see us such spinsters, we should hold you here forever. Peace be to you as I pursue this war, which shall be then beyond further reckoning. How oh, his longing follows his friend. <laughs> Since his depart, his sports, though craving seriousness and skill, passed slightly his careless execution, where nor gain made him regard or loss, consider but playing or business in his hand, another directing his head. His mind nurse equal these so differing twins. Have you observed him since our great Lord departed? With much labor. And I did love him for it. 
They too have cabined in many as dangerous as poor a corner, peril and want contending. They have skiff torrents whose roaring tyranny and power, at the least of these, was, was dreadful. And they have fought out together where death's self was lodged, yet fate hath brought them off. They're not of love, love tied, weaved, and tangled with so true, so long, and with a finger of so deep a cunning, may be outworn, never undone. I think Theseus cannot be umpire to himself, cleaving his conscience into twain and doing each side like justice, which he loves best. Doubtless there is a best, <laughs> and reason has no manners to say it is not you. <laughs> I was acquainted once with the time when I enjoyed a playfellow. You were at wars when she, the grave enriched, mm. who made too proud the bed, took leave of the moon, which then looked pale at parting, when our count was each eleven. Ah, twas Flavina. Yes. You talk of Prometheus and Theseus' love. Theirs has more ground, is more maturely seasoned, more buckled with strong judgment, and their needs, the one of the other, it may be said, to water their intertangled roots of love. But I and she I sigh and spoke of were things innocent. Loved, for we did, and like the elements that know not what nor why, yet do affect rare issue by their operants, our souls did so to one another. When she, what she liked was then of me approved, what not condemned, no more arraignment. The flower that I would pluck and put between my breasts, oh, then but beginning to swell about their blossom, she would long till she had an such another and commit it to the like same innocent cradle where phoenix-like they would die in perfume. On my head, no toy but what her pattern. Her affections, pretty though happily her careless wear, I followed for my most serious decking. Had mine ears stolen some new air or at adventure hummed one from musical coinage, why, it was a note whereon her spirit would sojourn, rather dwell on and sing it in her slumbers. This rehearsal, which every innocent what's well comes in like old important met bastards has this end that true love between maid and maid may be more than in sex individual you are out of breath and this high speeded pace is but to say that you shall never like the maid flavina love any that's called man i'm sure i shall not Oh, now, alack, weak sister, I must no more believe thee in this point, though in it I know thou dost believe thyself, then I will trust a sickly appetite that loathes even as it longs. But sure, my sister, if I were ripe for your persuasion, you have said enough to shake me from the arm of the all-noble Theseus, for whose fortunes I will now in and kneel with great assurance that we, more than his Pyrethius, possess the high throne in his heart. I am not against your faith, yet I continue mine. <laughs> <laughs> ah! To thee no star be dark. Old heaven and earth friend thee forever. All the good that may be wished upon thy head, I cry amen to it. Impartial gods who from the mountain heavens view us their mortal herd, behold who err and in their time chastise. Go and find out the bones of your dread lord, your dead lords, and honor them with treble ceremony. Rather than a gap should be in their dear rights, we would supply it but those we will depute, which shall invest you in your dignities, and even each thing our haste does leave imperfect. So would you, and heaven's good eyes look on you. What are those? Men of great quality, as may be judged by their appointment. Some of Thebes have told us they are sisters, children, and nephews to the king. At the helm of Mars, I saw them in the war, like to a pair of lions smeared with prey. McLean's and the troops aghast, 
I fixed my note constantly on them, for they were a mark worth a god's view. What was the prisoner told me when I inquired their names? With leave, they're called Arsite and Palamon. Tis right, those, those, are they are not dead? Nor in a state of life. Had they been taken when their last hurts were given, t'was possible they might be recovered, but yet breath and have the name of men. And like men use them. The very lees of such millions of rates exceed the wine of others. All our surgeons convent in their behoof, our richest balms rather than niggard waste. Their lives concern us much more than Thebes is worth. Rather than have them freed of this plight and in the morning state sound and at liberty, I would them dead. But 40,000 fold, we had rather have them prisoners to us than death. Bear them speedily from our kind air to them unkind and minister what man may, may do. For our sake more, since I have known frights, fury, friends, behests, loves, provocations, zeal, a mistress task, desire of liber liberty, a fever, madness, hath set a mark which nature could not reach to without some imposition, sickness in will or wrestling strength in reason. For our love and great Apollo's mercy, all our best, their best skill tender. Lead into the city, where having bound things scattered, we will post to Athens for our army. Urns and odors bring away. Vapors, sighs, darken the day. Our dull more deadly looks than dying. Balms and gums and heavy cheers. Sacred vials filled with tears. And clamors through the wild air flying. Come all sad and solemn shows. That our quick-eyed pleasures foes. We convent not else but woes. We convent, we convent but not else, else but woes. This funeral path brings to your household's grave. Joy sees on you again. Peace, sleep with him. This to yours. Yours this way. Heavens lend a thousand differing ways to one sure end. This world's a city full of straying streets, and death's the marketplace where each one meets. Oh, I may depart with thee little while I live. Something I might cast to you, not much, alas. The prison I keep, though it be for great ones, yet they seldom come. Before a salmon, you shall take a number of minnows. Uh, I am given out to be better lined than it can appear to me report and is a true speaker. I would I were whether I am delivered to be. Mary, what I have, be it what it be, I will assure my upon my daughter at the day of my death. Sir, I demand no more than your own offer and I will estate your daughter in what I have promised. Well, we will talk more of this when the solemnity is past. But have you a full promise of her? When that shall be seen, I tender my consent. <laughs> I have, sir. Oh, here she comes. Your friend and I have chanced to name you here upon the old business, but no more of that now. So soon as the court hurry uh, is over, we will have an end of it. Uh, I, in the meantime, look tenderly to the two prisoners. I can tell you they are princes. Oh, these strewings are for their chamber. Tis pity they are in prison, and twere pity they should be out. I do think they have patience to make any adversity ashamed. The prison itself is proud of them, and they have all the world in their chamber. They are famed to be a pair of absolute men. Oh, by my troth, I think fame but stammers them. They stand degrees above the reach of report. I heard them reported in the battle to be the only doers. Nay, most likely, for they are noble sufferers. I marvel how they would have looked had they been victors, that with such a constant nobility and force of freedom out of bondage, making misery their mirth and affliction a toy to jest at. Hmm, do they so? It seems to me they have no more sense of their captivity than I of ruling Athens. <laughs> they eat well, look merrily, discourse of many things, but nothing of their own restraint and disasters. Yet sometime a divided sigh, 
martyred as twere in the deliverance will break from one of them, when the other presently gives it so sweet a rebuke that I could wish myself a sigh to be so chid, or at least desire to be comforted. I never saw him. The duke himself came privately in the night, and so did they. But the reason it is, I know not. Look, yonder, there they are. The our side looks out. Uh, uh, no, sir, no. Oh, that's Palamon. <laughs> our side is the lower of the twain. You may perceive a part of him. Oh, go to, leave your pointing. They would not make us their object out of their sight. Oh, it is a holiday to look on them. Lord, the difference of men. <laughs> Uh, how do you, noble cousin? How do you, sir? Uh, why, strong enough to laugh at misery and bear the chance of war yet. We are prisoners, I fear, forever, cousin. I believe it. And to that destiny have patiently laid up my hour to come. Uh, cousin Arsite, where is Thebes now? Where is our noble country? Where are our friends and kindreds? Nevermore must we behold these comforts, never see the hardy youths strive for the game of sub honor, hung with the painted favors of their ladies, like tall ships under sail that start amongst them, and as an east wind leave them all behind us, like lazy clouds, whilst Palamon and our sight, even in the wagging of a wanton leg, outstrip the people's praises, won the garlands, ere they have time to wish them ours. Uh, never shall we to exercise like twins of honor our arms again and feel our fiery horses like proud seas under us. Our good swords now, better the red-eyed god of war ne'er wear, ravished our sides like age must run to rust and deck the temples of those gods that hate us. These hands shall never draw him out like lightning to blast whole armies more no palamon those hopes are prisoners with us here we are and here the graces of our youths must wither like a too timely spring here age must find us and which is the heaviest palamon unmarried the sweet uh. embraces of a loving wife loaden with kisses armed with thousand cupids shall never clasp our necks. No issue, no us, no figures of ourselves shall ever see to glad our age and, and like young eagles teach them boldly to gaze against bright arms and say, remember what your fathers were and conquer. <laughs> the fairy-eyed maids shall weep our banishments and in their songs, curse ever blinded fortune till she for shame see what a wrong she has done to youth and nature this is all our world we shall know nothing here but one another here nothing but the clock that tells our woes uh. mine shall grow but we shall never see it summer shall come and with her all delights but dead cold winter must inhabit here still tis true our sight to our Theban hounds that shook the aged forest with their echoes. No more now must we hollow. No more shake our pointed javelins whilst the angry swine flies like a Parthian quiver from our rages, struck with our well steeled darts. All valiant uses of the food and nourishment of noble minds in us too here shall perish. We shall die, which is the curse of honor, lastly children of grief mm. and ignorance yet cousin even from the bottom of these miseries from all that fortune can inflict upon us i see two comforts rising two mere blessings if the gods please to hold us here a brave patience and the enjoying of our griefs together whilst palamon is with me let me perish if i think this our prison <sighs> certainly Tis a main goodness, cousin, that our fortunes were twinned together. Tis most true, two souls put in two noble bodies, 
let them suffer the gall of hazard. So they grow together, will never sink. They must not say they could. A willing man dies sleeping and all's done. Shall we make worthy uses of this place that all men hate so much? How oh, gentle cousin. <laughs> Let us think this prison holy sanctuary to keep us from corruption of worse men. We mm. are young and yet desire the ways of honor. That liberty in common conversation, the poison of pure spirits, might like women woo us to wander from. What worthy blessings can be but our imaginations may make it ours. And here, being thus together, we are an endless mind to one another. We are one another's wife, ever begetting new births of love. We are father, friends, acquaintance. We are in one another families. I am your heir and you are mine. This place is our inheritance. <laughs> no hard oppressor dare take this from us. Here, with a little patience, we shall live long and loving. No surfeits seek us. The hand of war hurts none here, nor the seas swallow their youth. Were we at liberty, a wife might part us lawfully, or business. Quarrels consume us. Envy of ill men crave our acquaintance. I might sicken, cousin, where you should never know it, and so perish without our noble hand to close mine eyes or prayers to the gods. A thousand chances, were we from hence, would sever us. You have made me, I thank you, cousin Arsite, almost wanton with my captivity. <laughs> what a misery it is to live abroad and everywhere. Tis like a beast, methinks. I find the court here, I am sure, a more content and all those pleasures that woo the wills of men to vanity. I see through, through now and am sufficient to tell the world tis but a gaudy shadow mm. that old time as he passes by takes with him. What we had we been uh, old in the court of Creon, ah. where sin is justice, lust and ignorance, the virtues of the great ones. Cousin Arsight, I had I not the loving gods found this place for us, we had died as they do. Ill old men unwept and had their epitaphs, the people's curses. Shall I say more? I would hear you still. Oh, you shall. <laughs> Is there any record of any two that loved better than we do our sight? Sure, there cannot. I do not think it possible our friendship should ever leave us. Till our deaths it cannot. And after death, our spirits shall be led to those that love eternally. Uh, speak on, sir. Oh, this garden is, has a world of pleasures in it. <laughs> what flower is this? Tis called Narcissus, madam. That was a fair boy, certain, but a fool to love himself. Were there not maids enough? Uh, pray, forward. Yes. Or were they all hard-hearted? Mm, they could not be to one so fair. Thou oh, wouldst not. I think I should not, madam. <laughs> That's a good wench. But take heed to your kindness, though. Why, madam? Men are mad things. <laughs> Will ye go forward, cousin? Canst thou not work such flowers in silk, wench? Yes. I'll have a gown full of them. <sighs> and of these, this is a pretty color. Will it not do rarely upon a skirt, wench? Dainty, madam. Cousin, cousin, how do you, sir? Why, Palamon! Never till now I was in prison, our sight. Why, what's the matter, man? Behold and wonder, by heaven, she is a goddess. Oh, huh. uh, do reverence, she is a goddess, our sight. Of all flowers, mm -hmm. methinks a rose is best. Why, gentle madam? It is the very emblem of a maid. For when the west wind courts her gently, how modestly she blows and paints the sun with her chaste blushes. When the north comes near her, rude and impatient, then, like chastity, she locks her beauties in her butt again, 
and leaves him to base briars. Yet, good madam, sometimes her modesty will blow so far she falls for it. A maid, if she have any honor, would be loath to take his example by her. Thou art wanton! <laughs> she is wondrous fair. She is all the beauty extent. <sighs> the sun grows high. Let's walk in. Keep these flowers, and we'll see how near art can come near their colors. Oh, I am wondrous merry-hearted. I could laugh now. I could lie down, I am sure. And take one with you? That's as we bargain, madam. Well, agree, then. What think you of this beauty? <laughs> it is a rare one. It's but a rare one? Yes, a matchless beauty. Oh, might not a man well lose himself and love her? I cannot tell what you have done. I have. Brushrew mine eyes for it. Now I feel my shackles. You love her then? Who would not? And desire her. Before my liberty. I saw her first. Oh, that's nothing. Uh, but it shall be. I saw her too. Yes, but you must not love her. I will not, as you do, to worship her as is heavenly and blessed goddess. I love her as a woman to enjoy her, so both may love. You shall not love at all. Not love at all? Who shall deny me? I that saw first saw her, I that took possession, first time mine eyes uh, uh, of all those beauties in her, revealed to mankind. If thou lovest her, or entertainest a hope to blast my wishes, thou art a traitor, our sight, and a, a fellow false as thy title to her, friendship, blood and all the ties between us i disclaim if thou once think upon her yes i love her and if the lives of all my name lay on it i must do so i love her with my soul if that will lose ye farewell palamon i say again i love and in loving her maintain I am as worthy and as free a lover and have as just a title to her beauty as any Palamon or any living that is a man's son. Have I called thee friend? Yes, and have found me so. Why are you moved thus? Let me deal coldly with you. Am I not part of your blood, part of your soul? You have told me that I was Palamon and you were Arsite. Yes. Am I not, am not I liable to those affections, those joys, griefs, angers, fears, my friend shall suffer? Ye may be. Why then would you deal so cunningly, so strangely, so unlike a noble kinsman to love alone? Speak truly. Do you think me unworthy of her sight? No, but unjust if thou pursue that sight. Because another first sees the enemy, shall I stand still and let mine honor down and never charge? Yes, if he be but one. But... Say that one had rather combat me. Let that one say so, and use thy freedom else. If thou pursuest her, be as that cursed man that hates his country, a branded villain. Oh, you are mad. I must be, till thou art worthy, our sight, it concerns me. And in this madness, if I hazard thee and take thy life, I deal but truly. Fie, sir, you play the child extremely. I will love her. I must. I ought to do so. And I dare. And all this justly. Oh, that now. That now. That thy false self and thy friend had but this fortune to be one hour at liberty and grasp our good swords in our hands. I would quickly teach thee what were to filch affection from another. Thou art baser in it than a cut purse. Put but thy head out of this window more, and as I have a soul, I'll nail thy life to it. Thou darest not, fool. Thou canst not, thou art feeble. Put my head out. I'll throw my body out and leap the garden when I see her next, and pitch between her arms to anger thee. No more. 
The keeper's coming. I shall live to knock thy brains out with my shackles. <laughs> oh, do. By your leave, gentlemen. Now, honest keeper. Lord Eyesight, you must presently to the Duke, the cause I know not yet. I am ready, keeper. Prince Palamon, I must aware bereave you of your fair cousin's company. And me too, even when you please of life. Why is he sent for? It may be he shall marry her. He's goodly, and like enough the Duke hath taken notice both of his blood and body, but his falsehood. Why should a friend be treacherous? If that get him a wife so noble and so fair, let honest men never love again. Once more, I would but see this fair one, blessed garden and fruit and flowers more blessed that still blossom as her bright eyes shine on thee. Ye and what I were for all the fortune of my life hereafter, <laughs> yon little tree, yon blooming apricot, how I would spread and fling my wanton arms in at her window. I would bring her fruit fit for the gods to feed on. Youth and pleasure still as she tasted should be doubled on her. And if she be not heavenly, I would make her so near the gods and nature, they should fear her. And then I am sure she would love me. How now, Keeper? Where's our sight? Banished. Prince Prithius obtained his liberty, but never more. Upon his oath in life must he set foot upon his, this kingdom. Oh, he's a blessed man. He shall see Thebes again and call to arms the bold young men that when he bids him charge, fall like, on like fire. Our sight shall have a fortune if he dare make himself a worthy lover, yet in the field to strike a battle for her. And if he lose her then, he's a cold coward. How bravely he must bear himself to win her. If he be noble, our sight, thousand ways. Were I at liberty, I would do things of such a virtuous greatness that this lady, this blushing virgin should take manhood to her and seek to ravish me. My lord, for you I have this charge to... To discharge my life? No, but from this place to remove your lordship, the windows are to open. The devils take them that are in, so envious to me. Pretty kill me. And hang for it afterward? By this good light, had I a sword, I would kill thee. Why, my lord? Thou bringest such pelting scurvy news continually. Thou art not worthy life. I will not go. Indeed, you must, my lord. May I see the garden? No. That I am resolved. I will not go. I must constrain you then, and for you are dangerous. I'll clap more irons on you. Do, good keeper. I'll shake him so ye shall not sleep. I'll make ye a new Morris. Must I go? There is no remedy. Farewell, kind window. My rude wind never hurt thee. Ah, oh, my lady, if ever thou hast felt what sorrow was, dream how I suffer. Come, now bury me. Banish the kingdom. Tis a benefit, a mercy I must thank him for, but banished the free enjoying of that face I died for. Oh, t'was a studied punishment, a death beyond ma imagination. Such a vengeance that were I old and wicked, all my sins could never pluck upon me. Palamon, thou hast the start now. Thou shalt stay and see her bright eyes break each morning against thy window and let in life into thee. Thou shalt feed upon the sweetness of a noble beauty that nature never exceeded nor never shall. Good gods, what happiness has Palamon? Twenty-one, he'll come to speak to her 
and if she be as gentle as she's fair, I know she's his. He has a tongue will tame tempests and make the wild rocks wanton. Come what can come, the worst is death. I will not leave the kingdom. I know mine own is but a heap of ruins and no redress there. If I go, he has her. I am resolved another shape shall make me or end my fortunes. Either way, I am happy. I'll see her and be near her or no more. <laughs> <laughs> my masters, I'll be there, that's certain. <laughs> uh, I'll, and I'll be there. <laughs> and I. Why then have with ye, boars? Just put it shining. Let the plow play today. I'll tickle it out of the jade's tails tomorrow. I am sure to have my wife as jealous as a turkey. <laughs> but that's no one. I'll go through. Let her mumble. <laughs> Clap her abroad tomorrow night in store, and all's made up again. I <laughs> uh, but do put a fescue in her fist, and you shall see her take a new lesson out and be a good wench. Do we all hold against the May? Hold? What should aid us? Arcus will be there. And Sinos and Rikus and three better lads never danced under green tree. And you know what wenches, huh? <laughs> but will the dainty doming, the schoolmaster, keep touch, do you think? For he does all, you know. He'll eat a horn book ere he fail. Go to, the matter's too far driven between him and the tanner's daughter to let slip now. And she must see the duke and she must dance too. Uh -huh. Shall we be lusty? Oh. <laughs> all the boys in Athens blow wind in the breach on, and here I'll be, and there I'll be, and for our town, and here again, and there again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, boys, hi for the weavers. <laughs> this must be done in the woods. Ooh. Oh, pardon me. Oh, by any means, <laughs> our things of learning says so, for he himself will edify the duke most perilously at our behalfs. Uh, he's excellently in the woods. Bring him to the plains. His learning makes no cry. We'll see the sports, then every man to his tackle. And, sweet companions, let's rehearse by any means before the ladies see us and do so sweetly, and God knows what may come on it. What? Dent, the sports once ended, we'll perform. Away, boys, and hold. Yes. Uh, by your leaves, honest friends. Pray you, whither go you? Whither? What, what a question's that? <laughs> yes, tis a question to me that know not. Well, to the games, my friend. Where were you bred? You know it not? Uh, not far, sir. Are there such games today? <laughs> yes, <laughs> marry are there. And such as you never saw, the Duke himself will be in person there. Mm -hmm. What pastimes are they? Oh. Wrestling and running to the pretty fellow. Thou wilt not go along? Uh, not yet, sir. Well, sir, take your own time. Come, boys. All right. My mind misgives me. This fellow has a vengeance trick of the hip. Mark how his body is made for it. Huh. I'll be hanged, though, if he dare venture. Hang him, plum porridge. He wrestle. He roast eggs. Come, let's be gone, <laughs> lads. All right. <laughs> This is an offered opportunity I durst not wish for. Well, I could have wrestled, the best men called it excellent, and run swifter than wind upon a field of corn curling the wealthy ears never flew. I'll venture, and in some poor disguise, uh, I'll be there. Who knows whether my brows may not be girt with garlands, and happiness prefer me to a place where I may ever dwell in sight of her. Why should I love this gentleman? Tis odds he never will affect me. I am base. My father, the mean keeper of his prison, and he a prince. Ah, oh, to marry him is hopeless. To be his whore is witless. Ah, what a punt! What bushes are we wenches driven to when fifteen once has found us? Oh, first I saw him. 
I seeing thought he was a goodly man. <laughs> he has as much to please a woman in him if he pleased to bestow it so as ever these eyes yet looked on. Next I pitied him, and so would any young wench in my conscience that ever dreamed or vowed her maidenhead to a handsome young man. Then I loved him, extremely loved him, infinitely loved him. And yet he had a cousin, there is he too, but in my heart was Palamon, and there, Lord, what a coil he keeps. To hear him sing in an evening, and what a heaven it is! <laughs> and yet, his songs are sad ones. Fair spoken was never a gentleman. When I come in to bring him water in a morning, first he bows his noble body, then salutes me thus. Fair gentle maid, good morrow, may thy goodness get thee a happy husband. <laughs> Once he kissed me, I loved my lips the better ten days after. Oh, what he would do so every day. He grieves much, and me as much to see his misery. What should I do to make him know I love him? For I would fain enjoy him. Say I ventured to set him free. Oh, what says the law then? Oh, <laughs> this much for law and kindred, <laughs> I will do it. <laughs> and this night, or tomorrow, he shall love me. You have done worthily. I have not seen since Hercules a man of tougher sinews. Whatever you are, you run the best and wrestle that these times can allow. I am proud to please you. And what country bred you? This, but far off, Prince. Are you a gentleman? My father said so, and to those gentle uses gave me life. Are you his heir? His youngest, sir. Hmm. Your father sure is a happy sire, then. What proves you? A little of all noble qualities. I could have kept a hawk and well have hollowed to a deep cry of dogs. I dare not praise my feet in horsemanship, yet they that knew me would say it was my best piece. Last and greatest, I would be thought a soldier. You are perfect. <laughs> Upon my soul, a proper man. He is so. Well, how, do you, how do you like him, lady? I admire him. I have not seen so young a man so noble, if he say true, of his sort. I believe his mother was a wondrous handsome woman. His face, methinks, goes that way. But his body and fiery mind illustrate a brave father. Mark how his virtue, like a hidden sun, breaks through his baser garments. Mm, he's well got, sure. What made you seek this place, sir? Noble Theseus to purchase name and do my ablest service to such a well-found wonder as thy worth. For only in thy court of all the world dwells fair-eyed honor. All his words are worthy. <laughs> Sir, we are much indebted to your travel, nor shall you lose your wish. Perithius, dispose of this fair gentleman. Thanks, Theseus. Whate'er you are, you are mine, and I shall give you to a most noble service, to this lady, this bright young virgin. Pray observe her goodness. You have honored her fair birthday with your virtues, and as you do, you are hers. Kiss her fair hand, sir. Sir, you are a noble giver. Dearest beauty, let me seal my vow faith. When your servant, your most unworthy creature, but offends you, command him die, he shall. That were too cruel. If you deserve well, sir, I, I shall soon see it. You are mine, and somewhat better than your rank, I'll use you. I'll see you first, and, and because you say you are a horseman, I must needs entreat you this afternoon to ride. But tis a rough one. 
I like him better, Prince. I shall not then freeze in my saddle. Sweet, you must be ready, and you, Amelia, and you, friend, and all, tomorrow by the sun to do observance to flowery May in Diane's wood. Wait well, sir, upon your mistress. Emily, I hope he shall not go afoot. That were a shame, sir, while I have horses. Take your choice, and what you want at any time, let me but know it. If you serve faithfully, I dare assure you, you'll find a loving mistress. If I do not, let me find that my father ever hated disgrace and blows go oh, lead the way you have won it it shall be so you shall receive all dues fit for the honor you have won for wrong else sister beshrew my heart you have a servant that if i were a woman would be master but you are wise i hope too wise for that sir <laughs> Let all the dukes and all the devils roar, he is at liberty! <laughs> I have ventured for him, and out I have brought him to a little wood a mile hence. I have sent him where a cedar, higher than all the rest, spreads like a plain, fast by a brook, and there he shall keep close till I provide him files and food, for yet his iron bracelets are not off. Oh, love, what a start -hearted, stout hearted child thou art. My father durst better have endured cold iron than done it. Oh, I love him beyond love and beyond reason or wit or safety. <laughs> I have made him know it. I care not. I am desperate. If the law find me and then condemn me for it, some wenches, some honest-hearted maids will sing my dirge and tell to memory my death was noble, dying almost a martyr. That way he takes I purpose is my way too. <laughs> sure he cannot be so unmanly as to leave me here. If he do, maids will not so easily trust men again. And yet he has not thanked me for what I have done. No, not so much as kissed me, and that, methinks, is not so well. Nor scarcely could I persuade him to become a free man. He made such scruples of the wrong he did to me and to my father. Yet, I hope, <laughs> when he considers more, this love of mine will take more root within him. <laughs> Let him do what he will with me, so he use me kindly or use me he shall, or I'll proclaim him and to his face no man. I'll presently provide him necessaries and pack my clothes up and where there is a path of ground I'll venture so he be with me. <laughs> By him, like a shadow, I'll ever dwell. Within this hour, the hoopa will be all over the prison. <laughs> I am then kissing the man they look for. <laughs> Farewell, father. Get many more such prisoners and such daughters, and shortly you may keep yourself. <laughs> now, to him. The duke hath lost Hippolyta, each took a several land. This solemn rite they owe bloomed May, and the Athenians pay it to the heart of ceremony. Oh. Queen Amelia, fresher than May, sweeter than her golden buttons on boughs, or all the enameled knacks of the mead or garden. Yea, we challenge to the bank of any nymph that makes the stream seem flowers. Thou, oh, jewel of the wood of the, the world, hast likewise blessed a place with thy sole presence. In thy rumination that I, poor man, might eftsoons come between and chop on some cold thought, thrice blessed chance to drop on such a mistress, expectation most guiltless on it. Tell me, O oh Lady Fortune, next after my Emily, my sovereign, how far I may be proud. She takes strong note of me, hath made me near her, and this beauteous morn, the primest of all the year, 
presents me with a brace of horses. <laughs> Two such steeds might well be by a pair of kings backed in a field that crowns titles tried. Alas, alas, poor Palamon, poor prisoner, thou so little dreamest upon my fortune that thou thinkest thyself the happier thing to be so near Amelia. Me thou deemest at Thebes, and therein wretched, although free. But if thou knewest my mistress breathed on me, and that I eared her language, lived in her eye, oh, cousin, <laughs> what passion would enclose thee? Uh, traitor kinsman, thou shouldst perceive my passion if these signs of prisonment were off me, and this hand, but owner of a sword, by all oaths in one eye and the justice of my love would make thee a confessed traitor. Oh, thou most perfidious that ever gently looked, the voidest of honor that ever bore gentle token, the falsest cousin that ever blood made kin, callest her thou thine? Oh, thou, I'll prove it in my shackles with these hands, void of appointment. Oh, that thou liest, and thou art a very thief in love, a chiefy lord nor worth the name of a villain had I a sword and these house clogs away. Dear cousin Palamon. Cousin our, our sight, give me language such as thou hast showed me feet. Not finding in the circuit of my breast any gross stuff to form me like your blazon holds me to this gentleness of answer. Tis your passion that thus mistakes the which you, being enemy, cannot to me be kind. Honor and honesty I cherish and depend on howsoever you skip them in me. And with them, fair cuz, I'll maintain my proceedings. Pray. Be pleased to show in generous terms your griefs, since that your questions with your equal, who professes to clear his own way with the mind and sword of a true gentleman. But thou durst our sight. My cuz, my cuz, you have been well advertised how much I dare. You have seen me use my sword against the advice of fear, sure. Of another, you would not hear me doubted, but your silence should break out, though in the sanctuary. Sir, I have seen you move in such a place which well might justify your manhood. You were called a good knight and a bold, but the whole weeks were not fair if any day it rain. Their valiant temper men lose when they incline to treachery. And then they fight like compelled bears would fly were they not tied. Kinsman, you might as well speak this and act it in your glass as to his ear which now disdains you. Come up to me. Quit me of these old, these cold jives. Give me a sword, though it be rusty, and the charity of one good meal lend me. Come before me then a good sword in thy hand, and do but say that Emily is thine, I will forgive the trespass thou hast done me. Yea, my life, if then thou carry it, and brave souls in shades that have died manly, which will seek of me some news from earth. They shall not get none but this, that thou art brave and noble. Be content. Again betake you to your Hawthorne house. With Council of the night, I will be here with wholesome viands. These impediments will I file off. You shall have garments and perfumes to kill the smell of the prison. After, when you shall stretch yourself and say, but our sight, I am in plight, there shall be at your choice both sword and armor. Oh, you heavens, dares any so noble bear a guilty business. None but only our sight, therefore none but our sight in this kind is so bold. Sweet Palamon. I do embrace you and your offer, for your offer do it I only, sir, your person without hypocrisy. I may not wish more than my sword's edge on it. Oh. You hear the horns? Enter your musset. 
lest this match between us be crossed ere met. Uh, give me your hand. Farewell. I'll bring you everything needful thing. I, I pray you, take comfort and be strong. Pray hold your promise and do the deed with a bent brow. Most certain you love me not. Be rough with me and pour this oil out of your language. By this air, I could for each word give a cuff, my stomach not reconciled by reason. Plainly spoken, yet pardon me hard language. When I spur my horse, I chide him not. Content and anger in me have but one face. Hark, sir, they call scattered to the banquet. You must guess I have an office there. Sir, your attendance cannot please heaven, and I know your office unjustly is achieved. If a good title, I am persuaded this question, sick between us by bleeding, must be cured. I am a suitor that to your sword you will bequeath this plea and talk of it no more. But this one word, you are going now to gaze upon my mistress, for note you, mine she is. Nay, then I- Nay, pray you. You talk of feeding me to breed me strength. You are going now to look upon a sun that strengthens what it looks on. There you have a vantage o'er me, but enjoy it till I may enforce my remedy. Farewell. Oh, he has mistook the break I meant. He's gone after his fancy. Oh, tis now well nigh morning. No matter what it were perpetual night and darkness, Lord of the world. Hark, tis a wolf. Oh, in me have grief, slain, fear, and but for one thing I care for nothing, and that's Palamon. I reck not if the wolves would jaw me so he had this file. What if I hallooed for him? I cannot halloo. If I whooped, what then? Ah, uh, if he not answered. I should call a wolf and do him but that service. Oh, I have heard strange howls this live long night. Why may not be they have made prey of him? He has no weapons. He cannot run the jingling of his jeeves might call fell things to listen who have in them a sense to know a man unarmed and can smell where resistance is. I'll set it down. He's torn to pieces. Oh, they howled many together, and then they fed on him. <laughs> so much for that. Be bold to ring the bell. <sighs> oh, how stand I then? All's charred when he is gone. No, no, I lie, my father's to be hanged for his escape. Myself to beg if I prized life so much as to deny my act, but that I would not should I try death by dozens. <laughs> I am moped. Food took I none these two days. Sipped some water. I have not closed mine eyes, save when my lids scoured off their brine. Oh, alas, dissolve my life. Let not my sense unsettle, lest I should drown, or stab, or hang myself. Oh, state of nature, fail together in me since thy best props are warped. Which way is now? <laughs> the best way is the next way to a grave. Each errant step aside is torment. Lo, the moon is down. The crickets chirp. 
The screech owl ah, ah, calls in the dawn. All offices are done, save what I fail in. But the point is this. An end. And that is all. I should be near the place. Ho, oh, Cousin Palamon. Our sight? The same. I have brought you food and files. Come forth and fear not. <laughs> There's no Theseus. Nor none so honest, our sight. Uh, that's no matter. We'll argue that hereafter. Uh, come, take courage. You shall not die thus beastly. Here, sir, drink. I know you were faint, and then I'll talk further with you. Oh, our sight. Thou mayest now poison me. I, I might, but I must fear you first. <laughs> Sit down and good now, no more of these vain parleys. Let us not, having our ancient reputation with us, make talk for fools and cowards. To your health. Ah, um, mm -hmm. oh, do. Pray, sit down then and let me entreat you by all the honesty and honor in you. No mention of oh. this woman. It will disturb us. We shall have time enough. Well, sir, I pledge you. Drink a good hearty draught. It breeds good blood, man. Do you not feel it thaw you? Stay, I'll tell you after a drought or two more. <laughs> Spare it not. The Duke hath more, cuz. Uh, eat now. No. Oh, yes, yes. <sighs> I am glad you have so good a stomach. I'm glad I have so good meat to it. <laughs> Is it not mad lodging here in the wild woods, cousin? Yes, for them that have wild consciences. How tastes your vittles? Your hunger needs no sauce, I see. Mm, not much. But if it did, yours is too tart, sweet cousin. Oh. What is this? Uh, venison? Ah, tis a lusty meat. Mm, give me more wine. Here, our sight. To the wenches we have known in our days. <clears throat> ah, the Lord Steward's daughter. Do you remember her? Mm, after you, cuz. Mm, she loved a black-haired man. She did so well, sir. <laughs> and I have heard some call him our sight. And out with it. She met him in an arbor. What did she there cause? Play of the virginals? Something she did, sir. Made her groan a month for it, or two, <laughs> or three, or ten. The marshal's sister had her share, too, as I remember, cousin. Else there be tales abroad. You'll pledge her? Yes. <laughs> a pretty brown wench, tis. There was a time when young men went to hunting in the wood and a broad beach, and thereby hangs a tale. Hi-ho. For Emily, upon my life, oh. fool. Away with the strained mirth. I say again, that sigh was breathed for Emily, base cousin. Darest thou break first? You are wide. Uh -uh. By heaven and earth, there's nothing in thee honest. Then I'll leave you. You are a beast now. As thou makest me traitor. Uh, there's all things needful, uh, files and shirts and perfumes. I'll, I'll come again some two hours hence and bring that shall quiet all. A sword and armor. <laughs> Fear me not. You are now too foul. Farewell. Get off your trinkets. You shall want not. Tira. I I'll hear no more. If he keep touch, he dies for it. I am very cold, 
And all the stars are out too. The little stars and all that look like aglets. The sun has seen my folly. Oh, Solomon. Alas, no. He is in heaven. Where am I now? Yonder's the sea, and there's a ship. How oh, it tumbles. And there's a rock lies watching underwater. No, no, it beats upon it. No, 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 there's a leak sprung, a sound one. Oh, how they cry. Oh, put her before the wind. You'll lose all else. Up with the course or two and tack about, boys. Oh. Good night, good night, you are gone. I'm very hungry. Would I could find a fine frog. He would tell me news from all parts of the world. Then I would make a carrick of cockle shell and sail by east and northeast to the king of pygmies, for he tells fortunes rarely. Oh. Now my father, twenty to one, is trussed up in a trice tomorrow morning. I'll say never a word. For I'll cut my green coat a foot above my knee, and I'll clip my yellow locks an inch below mine eye. Hey, nanny, nanny, nanny. He's by me a cut forth for to ride, and I'll go seeking through the world that is wide. Hey, nanny, nanny, nanny. Oh, for a prick now, like a nightingale to put my breast against. I shall sleep like a top else. Oh, fie, fie, what tediosity and decent sanity is here among ye. Have my rudiments been labored so long with ye, milked unto ye? and by a figure even the very plump broth and marrow of my understanding laid upon ye and do you still cry where and how and wherefore you most coarse freeze capacities ye chain judgments have i said thus let be and there let be and then let be and no man understand me oh pro Deo medius fidius, you are all dunces. For why, here stand I, here the duke comes, there you are, close in the thicket, the duke appears, I meet him, and unto him I utter learned things, and many figures, and he hears, and nods, and hums, and then cries, rare, and I go forward. At length I fling my cap up. Mark there, then do you. As one did uh, Meliger and the boar break comely out before them. Like true lovers, cast yourselves in a body decently and sweetly by a figure, trace and turn. Boys? As sweetly we will do it, Master Gerald. Draw up the company. Where's the taborer? Why, Timothy? <laughs> but I say, where's their women? Here's prison modeling. Little Lucci uh, with the white legs and bouncy barbary. Oh, I'm freckled nail <laughs> that never failed her master. Where well, be your ribbons, maids? Swim with your bodies and carry it sweetly and deliberately. And now and then a, a favour and a frisk. Let us alone, sir. Where's the rest of the music? But dispersed as you commanded. Couple then and see what's wanting. Where's the pavian? Ah, my friend. Carry your tale without offence or scandal to the ladies, and be sure you tumble with audacity and manhood, and when you bark, do it with judgment. Yes, sir. Quo usque tandem? Here is a woman wanting. 
They go whistle all the fats in the fire. Oh, we have, as learned authors utter, washed a tile. We have been fatuous and laboured vainly. Oh, this is that scornful piece, that scurvy hildling that gave her promise faithfully that she would be here. Sicily, the sumptuous taught her the next gloves that I give her shall be dogskin. Nay, and she fail me once, you can tell, Arcus. She swore by wine and bread she would not break. An eel and woman, the learned poet says, unless less by the tail and with thy teeth thou hold, will either fail. In manners, this was false position. Fire will take her. Does she flinch now? What shall we determine, sir? Nothing. Our business is become a nullity. Yea, and a woeful and a piteous nullity. Now, when the credit of our town lay on it, now to be frample, not a pistol and nettle? Go thy ways, I'll remember thee, I'll fit thee. <laughs> oh, the George allow came from the south, from the coast of Barbary. And there he met brave gallants of war by one, by two, by three. Well hailed, well hailed, you jolly gallants. And whither now are you bound? Uh, oh, let me have your company till I come to the sounder. Uh. <laughs> there were three fools fell out about a howlet. The one said it was an owl. The other, he said nay. The third, he said it was a hawk, and her bells were cut away. <laughs> There's a dainty mad woman, master. Comes in the nick as mad as a March hare. If we can get her to dance, we are made again. I warrant her she'll do the rarest gambles. <laughs> a mad woman, <laughs> we are made, boy. <laughs> are you mad, good woman? Oh, I would be sorry else. Uh, give me your hand. Why? I can tell your fortune. Mm. Oh, you are a fool. Tell 10. I opposed him. Ah. <laughs> friend, you must eat no white bread. If you do, your teeth will bleed extremely. Shall we dance, huh? I know you. You're a tinker. Sir, I tinker, stop no more holes, but what you should. <laughs> hey, bony. A tinker, damsel? Or a conjurer. Raise me a devil now and let him play Kipasa well the bells and bones. <laughs> Go take her, take her, and fluently persuade her to a piece. Let opus, exigy, quad neck, jovis, ira, neck, ignis. Strike up and lead her in. Come, lass, let's trip it. Oh, I'll lead. Oh, do, do. <laughs> Persuasively and cunningly. <laughs> Away, boys. I hear the horns. Ah, give me some meditation and mark your cue. <sighs> Palace inspire me. Uh, this way the stag took. Stay and edify. Uh, what have we here? Some country sport upon my life, sir. Well, sir, go forward. We will edify. Ladies, sit down. We'll stay it. Oh, thou doughty duke, all hail, all hail, sweet ladies. Well, this is a cold beginning. If you but favor our country pastime, ladies. We are a few of those collected here that ruder tongues distinguish villager. And to say uh, verity and not to fable, we are a merry rout or else a ra rabble, or company, uh, or by a figure, chorus, that for thy dignity will dance uh, uh, Morris. And I, that am the rectifier of all, by title pedagogus, let that fall the birch upon the breeches of the small ones, and humble with a ferula the tall ones, do here present this machine or this frame and dainty duke whose doughty dismal fame from dis to dedalus from post to pillar is blown abroad help me thy poor well-willer and with thy 
twinkling eyes look right and straight upon this mighty maw of Micklewaite. Is now comes in with being glued together, makes Morris and the cause that we came hither. The body of our sport, of no small study, I first appear, though rude and raw and muddy, to speak before thy noble grace this tenor, and whose great feet I offer up my tenor. The next, the Lord of May and Lady Bright, the chambermaid and serving man, my knight, that seek out silent hanging. Then mine host and his fine spouse that welcomes to their cost the galled traveller, and with a beckoning informs the tapster to inflame the reckoning. Then the beast-eating clown, and next the fool, the Bavarian with his long tail, and eke long tool, cum multis alias that make a dance, say I and all shall presently advance. Aye, aye, by any means, dear Domine. Uh, produce. Knock for school. In trate filii, come forth and foot it. Oh, ladies, if we have been merry and have pleased you with a derry and a derry and a down, say a schoolmaster's no clown. Duke, if we have pleased, please thee too, and have done as good boys should do, give us but a tree or twain for a maypole, and again ere another year run out, we'll make thee laugh, and all this rout. Take twenty, Domine. How, how does my sweetheart? Never so pleased, sir. <laughs> Was an excellent dance, and for a preface, I never heard better. Uh, schoolmaster, I thank you. One see him all rewarded. And here's something uh, to paint your pole withal. Oh. Now, do our sports again. Oh, may the stag thou huntest stand long, and the dogs be swift and strong. May they kill him without Let's, and the ladies eat his dousets. <laughs> oh, come, we are all, we are all made. Die, deque, omnes, you have all danced rarely, wenches. About this hour, my cousin gave his faith to visit me again. And with him, bring two swords and two good armors. If he fail, he's neither man nor soldier. When he left me, I did not think a week could have restored my lost strength to me. I was grown so low and crestfallen with my wants. I thank thee, our sight. Thou art yet a fair foe, and I feel myself with all this refreshing, able once again to outdoor danger. To delay a longer would make the world think when it comes to hearing that I lay fatting like a swine to fight and not a soldier. Therefore this blessed morning shall be the last and that sword he refuses, if it but hold, I'll kill him with. Tis justice, so love and fortune for me. Good morrow. Good morrow, noble kinsman. I have put you to too much pain, sir. Uh, that too much, fair cousin, is, is but a debt of honor and my duty. Would you were so in all, sir? I could wish ye as kind a kinsman as you force me find a beneficial foe that my embraces might thank ye, not my blows. I sh shall think either well done a noble recompense. Then I shall quit you. Defy me in these fair terms, and you show more than a mistress to me. No more anger, as you love anything that's honorable. We were not bred to talk, man. When we are armed and both upon our guard, let 
our fury, like meeting of two tides fly strongly from us. And then to whom the birthright of this beauty truly pertains without abrading scorns, despisings of our persons and such poutings fitter for girls and schoolboys will be seen and quickly yours or mine. Will it please you arm, sir? Or if you feel yourself not fitting yet and furnished with your old strength, I'll stay, cousin, and every day discourse you into health as I am spared. Your person I am friends with, and I could wish I had not said I loved her, though I had died. But loving such a lady and justifying my love, I must not fly from it. Our sight. Thou art so brave an enemy that no man but thy cousin's fit to kill thee. I am well and lusty. Choose your arms. Uh, I choose you, sir. Wilt thou exceed in all, or dost thou do it to make me spare thee? I think so, cousin. You are deceived, for as I am a soldier, I will not spare you. That's well said. Uh, you'll find it. Then as I am an honest man and love with all the justice of affection, I'll pay thee soundly. This I'll take. Uh, that's mine then. I'll arm you first. Do. Pray, tell me, cousin, where got's this good armor? Uh, Tis the Duke's. And to say true, I stole it. Uh, do I pinch you? Uh, no. Is it not too heavy? <sighs> I have worn a lighter, but I shall make it serve. I'll buckle it close. Uh, by any means. Uh, you care not for a grand guard? No, no, we'll use no horses. I perceive you would fain be at that fight. I am indifferent. Faith, so am I. Uh, good cousin, th uh, thrust the buckle uh, through far enough. Uh, I warrant you. Uh, my cask now. Uh, uh, will you fight bare arms? We shall be the nimbler. Uh, but use your gauntlets, though. Those are the least. Pray thee, uh, take mine, good cousin. Thank you, our sight. How do I look? Am I fallen much away? Faith, very little. Love has used you kindly. I'll warrant thee. I'll strike home. Do, and spare not. I'll give you cause, sweet cousin. Now to you, sir. Methinks this armor is very like that, our sight. Thou worst the day the three kings fell, but lighter. Uh, that was a very good one. And that day, I well remember, you outdid me, cousin. I never saw such value. Valor, when you charged upon the left wing of the enemy, I spurred hard to come up. And under me, I had a right good horse. You had indeed. A bright bay, I remember. Yes, but all was vainly labored in me. You outwent me, nor could my wishes reach you. Yet a little I did by, by imitation. More by virtue, your modest cousin. When I saw you charge first, methought I heard a dreadful clap of thunder break from the troop. But still before that flew the lightning of your valor. But stay a little, is not this piece too straight? No, tis well. I would have nothing hurt thee but my sword. A bruise would be dishonor. <laughs> now I am perfect. Stand off then. Uh, take my sword. I, I hold it better. Uh, I thank thee. No, keep it. Your life lies on it. Here's one. But, it, but hold. I ask no more for all my hopes. My Cause and honor guard me. And me, my love. Is there aught else to say? Uh, this only, and no more. Thou art mine aunt's son, and that blood we desire to shed is mutual. In me, thine, and in thee, mine. 
My sword is in my hand. And if thou killst me, the gods and I forgive thee. If there be a place prepared for those that sleep in honor, I wish his weary soul that falls may win it. Fight bravely, cousin. Give me thy noble hand. Uh, here, Palamon. This hand shall never more come near thee with such friendship. I commend thee. If I fall, curse me and say I was a coward, for none but such dare die in these just trials. Uh, once more, uh, farewell, my cousin. Farewell, our city. Ha! 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 Lo, cousin, our folly has undone us. Why? This is the Duke hunting, as I told you. If we be found, we are wretched. Oh, retire for honor's sake and safely presently into your bush again, sir. We shall find too many hours to die in, gentle cousin. If you be seen, you perish instantly for breaking prison. And I, if you reveal me for my contempt, then all the world will scorn us and say we had a noble difference, but base disposers of it. No, no, cousin. I will no more be hidden nor put off this great adventure to a second trial. I know your cunning. I know your cause. He that faints now, shame take him. Put thyself upon thy present guard. <laughs> you are mad. Uh, or I will make the advantage of this hour mine own, and what to come shall threaten me. I fear less than my fortune. No weak cousin, I love Amelia, and in that I'll bury thee and all crosses else. Then come what can come, thou shalt know, Palamon, I dare as well die as discourse or sleep. Only this fears me, the law will have the honor of our ends. Have at thy life. Look to thine own well, our city. <clears throat> <clears throat> What ignorant and mad malicious traitors are you that against the tenor of my laws are making battle, thus like knights appointed, without my leave, and officers of arms? By Castor both shall die. Hold thy word, Theseus. We are certainly both traitors, both despisers of thee and of thy goodness. I am Palamon that cannot love thee. He that broke thy prison, think well what that deserves. And this is our sight. A bolder traitor never trod thy ground. A falser never seemed a friend. This is the man, was begged and banished. This is he, contemns thee and what thou darest do. And in this disguise against thy own edict follows thy sister, that fortunate bright star, the fair Amelia whose servant, if there be a right and seeing, and first bequeathing of the soul to, justly I am, and which is more dares think her his. This treachery, like a most trusty lover, I called him now to answer, if thou beest, as thou art spoken, great and virtuous, the true decider of all injuries. Say, fight again, and thou shalt seat me, Theseus, do such a justice thou thyself wilt envy. Then take my life. I'll woo thee to it. Oh, heaven, what more than man is this? I have sworn. We seek not thy breath of mercy, Theseus. Tis to me a thing as soon to die as thee to say it, and no more moved. Where this man calls me a traitor, let me say thus much. If in love be treason, in service of so excellent a beauty, as I love most, and in that faith will perish, as I have brought my life here to convert firm it, as I have served her truest, worthiest, as I dare kill this cousin that denies it. So let me be most traitor, and ye please me. For scorning thy edict, Duke, ask that lady why she is fair. And why her eyes command me, stay here to love her. And if she say traitor, I am a villain fit to lie unburied. 
thou shalt have pity of us both, Theseus, if unto neither thou show mercy. Stop, as thou art just, thy noble ear against us, as thou art valiant for thy cousin's soul, whose twelve strong labors crown his memory. Let's die together at one instant, Duke. Only a little let him fall before me, that I may tell my soul he shall not have her. Grant your wish. For to say true, your cousin hath ten times more offended, for I gave him more mercy than you found, sir, your offenses being no more than his. None here speak for him, for ere the sun set, both shall sleep forever. Alas, the pity. Now or never, sister, speak, not to be denied. That face of yours will bear the curses else of after ages for these lost cousins. My face, dear sister, I find no anger to them, nor no ruin. The misadventure of their own eyes kill them. Yet that I will be a woman and have pity, my knees shall grow to the ground, but I'll get mercy. Help me, dear sister. Indeed, so virtuous the powers of all women will be with us. Most royal brother, Sir, by our tie of marriage. By your own spotless honor. By that faith, that fair hand, and that honest heart you gave me. By that you would have pity in another, by your own virtues infinite. By valor, by all the chaste knights I have ever pleased you. These are strange conjurings. Nay, then, I'll in too. By all our friendship, sir by all our dangers, by all you love most, wars and this sweet lady. By that you would have trembled to deny a blushing maid. By your own eyes, by strength in which you swore I went beyond all women, almost all men, and yet I yielded, Theseus. To crown all this by your most noble soul, which cannot want due mercy, I beg first. Next hear my prayers. Last, let me entreat, sir. For mercy. Mercy. Mercy on these princes. You make my faith real. Say I felt compassion to them both. How would you place it? Upon their lives, but with their banishments. You are a right woman, sister. You have pity, but want the understanding where to use it. If you desire their lives, invent a way safer than banishment. Can these two live? and have the agony of love about them, and not kill one another? Every day they'd fight about you. Hourly, bring your honor in public question with their swords. Be wise then, and here forget them. It concerns your credit and my oath equally. I have said they die. Better they fall by the law than one another. Bow not my honor. Oh, my noble brother, that oath was rashly made, and in your anger your reason will not hold it. If such vows stand for express will, all the world must perish. Besides, I have another oath against yours of more authority. I am sure more love. Not made in passion, neither, but in good heed. What is it, sister? Urge it home, brave lady. That you would never deny me anything fit for my modest suit and your free granting. I tie you to your word now. If ye fall int, think how you, how you maim your honor. For now I am set a begging, sir. I am deaf to all but your compassion. How their lives might breed the ruin of my name. Opinion, shall anything that loves me perish for me? That were cruel wisdom. Do men prune straight young boughs that blush with thousand blossoms because they may be rotten? Oh, Duke Theseus, the goodly mothers that have groaned for these, and all the longing maids that ever loved, if your vows stand, shall curse me and my beauty, and in their funeral songs for these two cousins, despise my cruelty, and cry, woe worth me, till I am nothing but the scorn of women. For heaven's sake, save their lives and banish them. What conditions? Swear I'm never more to make me their contention, or to know me, to tread upon thy dukedom, and to be 
wherever they shall travel, ever strangers to one another. I'll be cut to a pieces before I take this oath. Forget I love her. Oh, all ye gods, despise me then. Thy banishment I not mislike, so we may fairly carry our swords and cause along, else never trifle. But take our lives, Duke. I must love and will, and for that love must and dare kill this cousin on any piece of the earth has. Will you, our sight, take these conditions? He's a villain then. These are men. No. <laughs> Never, Duke. Tis worse to me than begging to take my life so basely. Though I think I never shall enjoy her, yet I'll preserve the honor of affection and die for her. Make death a devil. What may be done? For now I feel compassion. Let it not fall again, sir. Say, Amelia, if one of them be were dead, as one must, are you content to take the other to your husband? They cannot both enjoy you. They are princes as goodly as your own eyes and as noble as ever fame yet spoke of. Look upon him. And if you can love, end this difference. I give consent. Are you content too, princes? With all our souls. He that she refuses must die then. Any and death, death thou canst invent, Duke. If I fall from that mouth, I fall with favor, and lovers yet unborn shall bless my ashes. If she refuses me, yet my grave <laughs> will wed me, and soldiers sing my epitaph. Make choice, then. But, sir, they are both too excellent. For me, a hair shall never fall of these men. What will become of them? Thus I ordain it, and by mine honor, once again it stands, or both shall die. You shall both to your country, and each within this month, accompanied with three fair knights, appear again in this place, in which I'll plant a pyramid. And whether before us that are here can force his cousin by fair and knightly strength to touch the pillar, he shall enjoy her. The other lose his head and all his friends. Nor shall he grudge to fall, nor think he dies with interest in this lady. Will this content he? Yes. Here, cousin Arsite, I am friends again till that hour. I embrace thee. Are you content, sister? Yes, I must, sir, else both miscarry. Come, shake hands again then, and take heed as you are gentlemen this quarrel sleep till the hour prefixed, and hold your course. Dare not fail thee, Theseus. Come. I'll give you now usage like to princes and to friends. When ye return, who wins, I'll settle here. Who loses, yet I'll weep upon his beer. Uh, hear you no more? Was nothing said of me concerning the escape of Palamon? Good sir, remember. Nothing I heard, for I came home before the business was fully ended. Yet I might perceive ere I departed a great likelihood of both their pardons. For fair Hippolyta and fair eyed Emily upon their knees begged with such handsome pity that the Duke methought stood staggering whether he should follow his rash oath or the sweet compassion of those two ladies. And to second them, that truly noble Prince Perithius, half his own heart set in two, uh, that I hope all shall be well. Uh, neither heard I one question of your name or his escape. Mm, pray heaven it holds so. Indeed. Oh, be of good comfort, man. I bring you news. Good news. They are welcome. Palamon has cleared you and got your pardon and discovered how and by whose means he escaped, which was your daughter's, whose pardon is procured too. And the prisoner, not to be held ungrateful to her goodness, has given a sum of money to her marriage. A large one, I assure you. You're a good man and ever bring good news. How has it ended? Why, as it should be, that they never begged, but they prevailed, had their suits fairly granted. The prisoners had their lives. I knew it would be so. Ah, but there be new conditions, which you'll hear of at better time. I hope they are good. Oh, they are honorable. How good they'll prove, I, I know not. It will be known. 
Bless, sir. Where's your daughter? Why do you ask? Oh, <laughs> sir, uh, wh when did you see her? How he looks. This morning. Was she well? Was she in health? Uh, sir, when did she sleep? These are strange questions. I do not think she was very well, for now you make me mind her, but this very day I asked her questions and she answered me so far from what she was, so childlessly, so sillily, as if she were a fool uh, and innocent. And I was very angry, but what of her, sir? Nothing but my pity. Don't, but you must, you must know it, and as good by me as by another that less loves her. Well, sir? Not right? Not well. No, sir, not well. Tis too true. She is mad. It cannot be. Believe you'll find it so. I have suspected what you told me. The gods comfort her. Either this was her love to Palamon or fear of my miscarrying on escape or both. Tis likely. But why all this haste, sir? I'll tell you quickly. As I late was angling in the great lake that lies behind the palace from the far shore, thick set with reeds and sedges, as patiently I was attending sport, I heard a voice, a shrill one, and attentive I gave my ear when I might well perceive t'was one that sung, and by the smallness of it, a boy or woman. I then left my angle to his own skill, came near, but yet perceived not who made the sound. The rushes and the reeds had so encompassed it. I laid me down and listened to the words she sung, for then through a small glade cut by the fishermen, I saw it was your daughter. Uh, pray go on, sir. She sung much, but no sense. Only I heard her repeat this often. Palamon is gone, he's gone to the wood to gather mulberries. I'll find him out tomorrow. Oh, pretty soul. His shackles will betray him, he'll be taken. And what shall I do then? I'll bring a bevy, a hundred black-eyed maids that love as I do, with chaplets on their heads as daffodillies, with cherry lips and cheeks of damask roses. And we'll all dance an antic for the Duke and beg his pardon. <laughs> then she talked of you, sir, that you must lose your head tomorrow morning. And she must gather flowers to bury you and see the house made handsome. <laughs> then she sung nothing but willow, willow, willow. And between ever was. Palamon, fair Palamon, and Palamon was a tall young man. The place was knee deep where she sat, her careless tresses, a wreath of bulrush rounded about her stuck thousand fresh water flowers of several colors that he thought she appeared like the fair nymph that feeds the lake with waters, or as Iris newly dropped down from heaven, rings, she made of rushes that grew by and, and to whom spoke the, the prettiest posies. Thus our true love tied. This you may lose, not me. <laughs> and many a one had been. She wept and sung again and sighed and with the same breath smiled and kissed her hand. Oh, alas, what pity it is. I made in to her. She saw me and straight sought the flood. I saved her and, and set her safe to land when presently she slipped away and to the city made with such a cry and swiftness that, believe me, she left me far behind her. Three or four, I saw her far off cross her. One of them I knew to be your sister where she stayed and fell, scarce to be got away. I, I left them with her and hither came to tell you. Hmm. Oh, oh, here they are. May you never more enjoy the light. Is not this a fine song? Oh, a very fine one. I can sing 20 more.
I think you can. Yes, truly, can I? <laughs> I can sing the broom and Bonnie Robin. Are you not a tailor? Yes. Where's my wedding gown? I'll bring it tomorrow. Do very early. I must be abroad else to call the maids and pay the minstrels for. I must lose my maiden head by cocklight. <laughs> Twill never thrive else. Oh, fair, oh, sweet. You must even take it patiently. It is true. Good even, good men. Uh, pray, did you ever hear of one young Palamon? Yes, wench, we know him. It's not a fine young gentleman. <laughs> Tis love. <laughs> no means cross her. She is distempered far worse than now she knows. Yes, he is a fine man. Oh, is he so? You have a sister? Yes. But she shall never have him. Tell her so. For a trick that I know. You would best look to her. For if she see him once, she's gone. She's done and undone in an hour. All the young maids of our town are in love with him, but I laugh at him and let them alone. <laughs> is not a wise course? Yes. There is at least 200 now with child by him. Well, there must be four. Yet I keep close for all this, close as a cockle. And all these must be boys. He has the trick on it. And at 10 years old, they must all be gelt for musicians and sing the wars of Theseus. This is strange. Has you ever heard, but, but say nothing. No. They come from all parts of the dukedom to him. Oh, weren't you? He had not so few last night as 20 to dispatch. <laughs> He'll tickle up in two hours if his hand be in. <laughs> Lost, past all cure. Heaven forbid, man. Oh, come hither. You are a wise man. Does, does she not know him? No, would she did. You are master of a ship? Uh, yes. Where's your compass? Here. Set it to the north, and now direct your course to the wood where Palamon lies longing for me. For the tackling, let me alone. Come, weigh my heart cheerily. Where's your whistle, a master? Let's get her in. Oh. To the top, boy. What canst thou? Uh, here. What canst thou? A fair wood. Oh, bear for it, master, tack about! <laughs> when Cynthia with her borrowed light. Yet I may bind up those wounds that must be opened and bleed to death for my sake else. I'll choose and end their strife. Two such young and handsome men shall never fall for me. Their weeping mothers, following the dead cold ash of their sons, shall never curse my cruelty. Good heaven, what a sweet face has our sight. If wise nature, with all her best endowments, all those beauty she sows into the births of noble bodies, were here a mortal woman and had in her a coy denial of young maids, yet doubtless she would run mad for this man. What an eye of what fiery sparkle and quick sweetness has this young prince. Here, love himself sits smiling. Just such another wanton Ganymede set Jove afire with and enforce the god, snatch up the goodly boy, and set him by him, a shining constellation. What a brow! Of what spacious majesty he carries, arched like the great-eyed Juno, but far sweeter, smoother than Pelop's shoulder. Fame and honor 
Methinks from hence, as from a promontory, promontory pointed in heaven, should clap their wings and sing to all the underworld the loves and fights of gods and such men near him. Palamon is but his foil, to him a mere dull shadow. He's swarth and meager, of an eye as heavy as if he lost his mother. A still temper, no stirring in him, no alacrity. Of all this sprightly sharpness, not a smile. Yet, these errors that we count may become him. Narcissus was a sad boy, but a heavenly. <sighs> Who can find the bent of women's fancy? I am a fool. My reason is lost on me. I have no choice. And I have lied so lewdly that women ought to beat me. On my knees I ask for thy pardon, Palamon. Thou art alone and only beautiful. And these eyes, these, the bright lamps of beauty that command and threaten love. And yet what young maid dare cross them? What a bold gravity and yet inviting has his brown manly face. Oh, love, this only from this hour is complexion. <sighs> Lie there, our sight. And thou art a changeling to him, a mere gypsy, and this, the noble body. I am sodded, utterly lost, my virgins, Faith has fled me, for if my brother but were now to ask me whether I loved, I'd run mad for our sight. Now if my sister, more for Palamon, stand both together, now come ask me, brother. Alas, I know not. Ask me now, sweet sister, I may go look. What a mere child is fancy that having two fair gods of equal sweetness cannot distinguish but must cry for both. How now, sir? I'm the noble duke, your brother, madam. I bring you news. The knights are come. To end the quarrel? Yes. Would I might end first. What sins have I committed, chaste Diana, that my unspotted youth must now be soiled with the blood of princes? And my Chastity made the altar for where their lives of lovers, too greater and too better, never yet made mother's joy, must be the sacrifice to my unhappy beauty. Bring him in <clears throat> quickly, by any means. <clears throat> I long to see him. Your two contending lovers are returned, and with them, their fair knights. Now, my fair sister, you must love one of them. I'd rather both. So neither for my sake should fall untimely. Who saw him? I a while. And I. Uh, from whence come you, sir? Uh, from the knights. <clears throat> Pray speak, you that have seen them, what they are. I will, sir, and truly what I think. Six braver spirits than these they have brought, if we judge by the outside, I never saw nor read of. He that stands in the first place with our sight by his seeming should be a stout man, by his face a prince, his very looks, so say him, his complexion nearer a, a brown than black, stern and, and yet noble, which shows him hardy, fearless, proud of dangers. The, the circles of his eyes show fire within him and is a heated lion, so he looks. His hair hangs long behind him, black and shining like raven's wings, his shoulders broad and strong, armed long and round, and on his thigh a sword hung by a curious baldric when he frowns to steal his will with. Better my mm -hmm. conscience was never a soldier's friend. Thou hast well described him. Yet a great deal short, methinks, of him that's first with Palamon. Pray, speak him, friend. I guess he is a prince too, and if it may be greater for a show, he hath, has all the ornament of honor in it. He's somewhat bigger than the knight he spoke of, but of a face far sweeter. His complexion is as ripe grape ruddy. 
he has felt without doubt what he fights for and so after to make this cause his own. In his face appears all the fair hopes of what he undertakes. And when he's angry, then a settled valor, not tainted with extremes, runs through his body and guides his arms to brave things. Fear he cannot. He shows no such soft temper. His head yellow, hard-haired, and curled thick twin like ivory tods, not to undo with thunder. In his face, the livery of the warlike maid appears pure red and white, for yet no beard has blessed him. And in his rolling eyes sits victory. And if she ever meant to crown his valor, his nose stands high, oh, a character of honor. His red lips after fights are fit for ladies. Must these men die too? When he speaks, his tongue sounds like a trumpet. All his lineaments as a man would wish him strong and clean. He wears a well-distilled axe, the staff of gold. His age some five and twenty. There's another, a little man, but a tough soul, seeming as great as any. Fairer promises in such a body, yet I never looked on. Oh, he that's freckle-faced. Ah, the same, my lord. Are they not sweet ones? <laughs> yes, they are well. Methinks, being so few and well disposed, they show great and fine art in nature. He's white-haired, not wanton white, but such a manly color next to an auburn. Tough and, and nimble set, which shows an active soul. His, his arms are brawny, lined with strong sinews to the shoulder piece. Gently they swell, like women new conceived. Uh, which speaks him prone to labor, never fainting under the weight of arms, stout-hearted still, but when he stirs a tiger. He's gray-eyed, which yields compassion where he conquers, sharp to spy advantages, and where he finds them, he's swift to make them his. He does no wrongs, nor takes none. He's round-faced, and when he smiles, he shows a lover. When he frowns, a soldier. About his head he wears the winter's, the winter's oak, and in it stuck the favor of his lady. His age some six and thirty, six and thirty. In his hand he bears a charging staff embossed with silver. Are they all thus? They are all the sons of honor. Now as I have a soul, I long to see him. Lady, you shall see, see men fight now. I wish it, but not the cause, my lord. They would show bravely about the titles of two kingdoms. Tis pity love should be so tyrannous. Oh, my soft-hearted sister, what think you? Weep not till they weep blood. Wench, it must be. You have steeled them with your beauty. Honored friend, to you I give the field. Pray, order it, fitting the persons that must use it. Yes, sir. Come, I'll go visit them. I cannot stay. Their fame has fired me so till they appear. Good friend, be royal. There shall want no bravery. Hmm. Go weep, for whosoever wins loses a noble cousin for thy sins. Her distraction is more at some time of the moon than other some, is it not? Oh, she is continually in a harmless distemper, mm. sleeps little, altogether without appetite, save often drinking, dreaming mm. of another world and a better, and what broken piece of matter soever she's about. The uh. name Palamon lards it, but she mm. farces every business with all, fits it to every question. Look. Mm. Where she comes, you shall perceive her behavior. I have forgot it quite. The burden on twas down, down. Penned by no worse man than Geraldo, Amelia's schoolmaster. He's as fantastical too as ever he may go on pond's legs, for in the next world will Dido see Palamon. And then she will be out of love with Aeneas. What stuff's here, poor soul? 
even thus all day long. Now mm -hmm. for this charm that I told you of, you must bring a piece of silver on the tip of your tongue or no fairy. Then if it be your chance to come where the blessed spirits, <laughs> there's a sight now, we maids that have our livers perished, cracked to pieces with love. We shall come there and do nothing all day long but pick flowers with proserpine. Then will I make Balaman a nosegay, then let him mark me then. How oh, prettily she's a mist. Note her a little further. Faith, I'll tell you. Sometime we go to barley break. We of the blessed, alas, tis a sore life they have in the other place. Such burning, frying, boiling, hissing, howling, chattering, cursing. Oh, they have shrewd measure. Take heed. If one be mad or hang or drown themselves, thither they go. Oh, Jupiter bless us. And there shall we be put in a cauldron of lead and usurer's grease amongst a whole million of cut purses and their boil like a gum and a bacon that will never be enough. How her brain coins. Lords and courtiers that have got maids with child, they are in this place. They shall stand in fire up to the navel and in ice up to the heart, and there the offending part burns and the deceiving part freezes. In truth, a very grievous punishment as one would think for such a trifle. Believe me, one would marry a leprous witch to be rid on, I'll assure you. How she continues this fancy, it is not engraft madness, but a most thick and profound melancholy. You hear there a proud lady and a proud city wife howl together. I were a beast, and I'll call it a good sport. One cries, oh, this smoke, the other, this fire. One cries, oh, that I ever did it behind the arras. <laughs> And then howls. The other curse is a suing fellow and her garden house. Mm. I will be true, my stars, my fate. What think you of her, sir? I think she has a perturbed mind which I cannot minister to. Alas, what then? Understand you. She ever affected any man ere be she beheld Palamon. I was once, sir, in great hope she had fixed her liking on this gentleman, my friend. Hmm. I think so too, and would account I had a <laughs> great penworth on it to give half my state that both she and I at this present stood unfeignedly unseen terms. Yes. <clears throat> That intemperate surfeit of her eye hath distempered the other senses that may return and settle again to execute their preordained faculties, but they are now in the most extravagant vagary. This you must do. Confine her to a place where light may rather seem to steal in than be permitted. Take upon you, young sir, her friend, the name of Palemon. Say you come to eat with her and, and to commune of love. This will catch her attention, for this her mind beats upon. No other object that is inserted twixt her mind and I become the pranks and friskins of her madness. Sing to her such green songs of love as she says, Palamon hath sung in prison. Hmm? Hmm? Come to her stuck in as sweet flowers as the season is mistress of, and there too make an addition of some other compounded odors which are hmm, grateful. To the senses, yes, yes, yes. All this shall become 
Palemon, yeah, yeah, for for Palemon can sing, yeah, yeah. and and and, and Palemon is, is sweet, and every good thing, desire to eat with her, carve her, drink to her, and still among, intermingle your petition of grace and acceptance into into her favor yes, yes 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 learn what maids have been companion and playfarers and let them repair to her with palamon in their mouths and appear with tokens as if suggested for him it is a falsehood she is in and it is with falsehoods that it is to be combated this may bring her to to what to to eat to eat to 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 sleep hmm? Hmm? And, and reduce what's now square out of her into their former what their former law and regiments i have seen it approved how many times have, I, I i i know not but make the number more, I have great hope in this. I will, between the passages of this project, come in with my appliance. Let us put into execution and hasten the success, which no doubt will bring, will bring forth, will bring forth comfort. Yes, comfort indeed, yes. Now, let them enter, and before the gods tender their holy prayers. Let the temples burn bright with sacred fires, and the altars in hallowed clouds commend their swelling incense to those above us. Let no Jew be wanting. They have, ha they have a noble work in hand, will honor the very powers that love them. Sir, they enter. You valiant and strong-hearted enemies. You royal germane foes that this, this day come to blow that nearness out that flames between ye. They buy your anger for an hour and dove-like before the holy altars of your helpers, the all feared gods bow down your stubborn bodies. Your ire is more than mortal, so your help be. And as the gods regard ye, fight with justice. Leave you to your prayers and betwixt ye, I'll part my wishes. Honor crown the worthiest. The glass is running now that cannot finish till one of us expire. Think you but thus, that were there aught in me which strove to show mine enemy in this business, were one eye against another, arm oppressed by arm, I would destroy the offender, cause I would, though parcel of myself, then from this gather how I should tender you. I am in labor to push your name, your ancient love, our kindred out of my memory, and in the self-same place to seek something I would confound. So hoist we the sails that must these vessels port, even where the heavenly limiter pleases. You speak well. Before I turn, let me embrace thee, cousin. This I shall never do again. One farewell. Why, let it be so. Farewell, cuz. Farewell, sir. Knights, kinsmen, lovers, yea, my sacrifices. True wor worshippers of Mars, whose spirit in you expels the seeds of fear and the apprehension which still is farther off it. Go with me before the God of our profession. There, require of him the hearts of lions and the breath of tigers. Yea, the fierceness too. Yea, the speed also to go on. I mean, else wish we to be snails. You know my prize must be dragged out of blood. Force and great feet must put my garland on where she sticks the queen of flowers. Our intercession then, 
must be to him that makes the camp a cistern brimmed with the blood of men. Give me your aid and bend your spirits towards him. Thou, mighty one, that with thy power hast turned green Neptune into purple, whose approach comets pre-warm, whose havoc in vast field on earth's skulls proclaim, whose breath blows down the teeming Ceres's poison, who dost pluck with hand armipotent from forth blue crowd clouds the mason turrets that both makest and breakest the stony girths of cities. Me, thy pupil, youngest follower of, my, of thy drum, instruct this day with military skill that to thy laud I may advance my streamer and by thee be styled the lord of the day. Give me, great Mars, some token of thy pleasure. O oh, great corrector of enormous times, shaker of o'er-ranked states, thou grand decider of dusty and old titles that healest with blood the earth when it is sick and curest the world of thy pleurisy of people, I do take thy signs auspiciously, and in thy name, to my design, march boldly. Let us go. Our stars must glister with new fire or be today extinct. Our argument is love, <clears throat> which if the goddess of it grant, she gives victory too. Then blend your spirits with mine, you whose free nobleness do make my cause your personal hazard. To the goddess Venus, commend me, we are proceeding and implore her power unto our party. Hail, sovereign queen of secrets, who has power to call the fiercest tyrant from his rage, to weep unto a girl that has the might even with an eye glance to choke Mars' drum and turn the alarm to whispers that canst make a cripple flourish with his crutch and cure him before Apollo, that mayest force the king to be his subject's vassal and induce stale gravity to dance. The pole bachelor, whose youth like wanton boys through bonfires hath skipped thy flame, at seventy thou canst catch and make him to the scorn of his hoarse throat. Abuse young lays of love. What godlike power hast thou not power upon? To Phoebus thou as flames, hotter than his, the heavenly fires did scorch his mortal son, thine him. The huntress, all moist and cold, some say, begin to throw her bow away and sigh. Take to thy, take to thy grace, me thou void, vowed soldier who do bear thy yoke as twere a wreath of roses yet is heavier than lead itself stings more than nettles i have never been foul-mouthed against thy law never revealed secret for i knew none would not had i kenned all that were i never practiced upon man's wife nor would the libels read of liberal wits I never at great feasts sought to betray a beauty, but have blushed at simpering sirs that did. I have been harsh to large confessors and have hotly asked them if they had mothers. I had one, a woman, and women where they wronged. I knew a man of 80 winters, this I told them, who, alas, of 14 brided. Twas thy power to put life into dust. The aged cramp had screwed his square foot round. The gout had knit his fingers into knots, torturing convulsions from his globby eyes, had almost drawn their spears, that what was life in him seemed torture. This anatomy had by his young fair fear a boy, and I believed it was his, for she swore it was. And who would not believe her? 
Brief I am to those that prate and have done no companion, to those that boast and have not a defier, to those that would and cannot a rejoicer. Yea, him I do not love that tells close offices the foulest way, nor names concealments in the boldest language. Such a one am I, and vow that lover never yet made sigh truer than I. Oh, then, most soft, sweet goddess, give me the victory of this question, which is true love's merit, and bless me with a sign of thy great pleasure. Oh, that thou, from eleven to ninety reign, mortal bosoms, whose chaste is this word, and we in herds thy gain, I give thee thanks for this fair token, which being laid unto mine innocent true heart, arms and assurance my body to this business, let us rise and bow before the goddess. Time comes on. O oh, sacred, shadowy, cold and constant queen, abandoner of revels, mute, contemplative, sweet solitarity, white as chaste and pure as wind fan snow, who to thy female knights allow us no more blood than will make blush, which is their order's robe. I hear thy priest, am humbled for thine altar. O oh, vouchsafe with that thy rare green eye, which never yet beheld a thing maculate, look on thy virgin and sacred silver mistress, lend thine ear, which never heard scurl turn into whose port never entered wanton sound to my petition seasoned with holy fear. This is my last Vestal office. I am bride habited, but maiden hearted. A husband I have pointed, but do not know him. Out of two, I should choose one and pray for his success, but I am guiltless of election. Of mine eyes, were I to lose one, they are equal precious. I could doom neither. That which perish should go to it unsentenced. Therefore, most modest queen, he of the two pretenders that best loves me and has the truest title in't, let him take off my wheaten garland or else grant the file and quality I hold I may continue in thy band. See what our general ebbs and flows out from the bowels of her holy altar with Sacred act advances, but one rose. If well inspired, this battle shall confound both these brave knights, and I, a virgin flowered, must grow alone unplucked. The flower is fallen, the tree descends. Oh, mistress, thou here dischargest me. I shall be gathered, I, I think so but I know not thine own will. Unclasp thy mystery. I hope she's pleased. Her signs were gracious. Has this advice I told you done any good upon her? <laughs> Oh, very much. The maids that kept her company have half persuaded her that I am Palamon. <laughs> Within this half hour, she came smiling to me and asked me what I would eat. And when I would kiss her, I told her presently and kissed her twice. Twas well done. Twenty times had been far better for there the cure lies mainly. Then she told me she would watch with me tonight for well she knew what hour my fit would take me. Let her do so. And when your fit comes, fit her home and presently. 
<laughs> she would have me sing? You did so? No. It was very ill done then. You should have observed her everywhere. Alas, I have no voice, sir, to confirm her that way. That's all one. If you make a noise, she'll, if she entreats you again, do anything. Lie with her, if she asks you. Oh, oh there, doctor. <laughs> yes, 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 in the way of a cure. But first, by your leave, in the way of honesty? That's but a niceness. Never cast your child away for honesty. Cure her first this way. Then if she will be honest, she has a path before her. Thank you, doctor. Pray bring her in. Let's see how she is. I will, and tell her her palamon stays for her. But doctor, methinks you are still in the wrong. Go, 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 go. Your father's a fine fool. Her honesty. <laughs> and we should give her physic till we find that. Why? Do you think she's not honest, sir? How old is she? She's 18. She may be, but that's all one. Tis nothing to our purpose, and ere her father says, if you perceive her mood inclining that way that I spoke of. <laughs> the way of the flesh. <laughs> you have me? <laughs> yeah, 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 very, very, very well, sir. <laughs> Please, her appetite. Do it home. It cures her ipso facto, the melancholy <laughs> humor that <laughs> infects her. <laughs> <laughs> I am a... I love your mind, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find it so. She comes, pray, humor her. Come, your love Palamon stays for you, child, and has done this long hour to visit you. Oh, I thank him for his gentle patience. He is a kind gentleman, and I am much bound to him. Did you never see the horse he gave me? Yes. How do you like him? He, he's a very fair one. You never saw him dance? No. I have often. He dances very finely, very comely, and for a jig, come cut and long tailed to him, he turns you like a top. That's fine indeed. He'll dance the Morris 20 mile an hour, and that will founder the best hobby horse, if I have any skill in all the parish, and gallops to the tune of Light of Love. What do you think of this horse? Mm, having these virtues, I think he might be brought to play at tennis. Alas, <laughs> that's nothing. <laughs> Can he write and read too? <laughs> A very fair hand and cast himself the accounts of all his hay and provender. Mm. That hostler must rise betime that cousins him. You know the chestnut mare the Duke has? Very well. She is horribly in love with him. Poor uh -oh. beast. <laughs> <laughs> but he is like his master, coy and scornful. Oh, what dowry has she? Some 200 bottles and 20 strike of oats, but he'll ne'er have her. He lisps in his neighing, able to entice a miller's mare. He'll be the death of her. What stuff she utters. Make her see, here your love comes. <sighs> Pretty soul. How do ye? That's a fine maid. <laughs> oh, no, there's a curtsy. <laughs> Yours to command in the way of honesty. How far is now to the end of the world, my masters? Why, a, a, a day's journey went. Hmm. Oh, will you go with me? What shall we do there, wench? Why, play a stool ball. What else is there to do? <laughs> well, I am content. If we shall keep our wedding there. Tis true. For there, I will assure you, we shall find some blind priest for the purpose that will venture to marry us. For here, they are nice and foolish. Besides, my father must be hanged tomorrow, and that would be a blot in the business. Are not you, Palman? 
Do not you know me? Uh, yes, but you care not for me. I have nothing but this poor petticoat and two coarse smocks. That's all one. I will have you. Will you surely? By this fair hand will I. Oh, we'll to bed then. <laughs> oh, even when you will. <laughs> oh, sir, <laughs> you would fain be nibbling. <laughs> oh, why do you rub my kiss off? Oh, it is a sweet one, and will perfume me finely against the wedding. Is not this your cousin Arsite? Yes, sweetheart, I am glad my cousin Palamon has made so fair a choice. Do you think he'll have me? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Do you think so, too? Yes. We shall have many children. Lord, how you're grown. My Palamon, I hope, will grow, too, finally, now he's at liberty. Alas, poor chicken. He was kept down with hard meat and ill lodging, but I'll kiss him up again. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hear? You'll lose the noblest sight that e'er was seen. Are they in the field? They are. You bear a charge there, too. All the way straight. I must even leave you here. Nay, we'll go with you. I will not lose the fight. How did you like her? I'll warrant you within these three or four days. I'll make her right again. You must not from her, but still preserve her in this way. Hmm? I will. Let's get her in. Uh, come, sweet. We'll go to dinner, and then we'll play at cards. Shall we kiss, too? A hundred times. And twenty? I and twenty. <laughs> and then we'll sleep together? Take her offer. <laughs> Yes, marry will we? Oh, but you should shall not hurt me. Uh, I will not, sweet. Oh, if you do love, I'll cry. I'll step no further. Will you lose this sight? I had rather see a wren hawk at fly than this decision. Every blow that falls threats a brave life. Each stroke laments the place whereon it falls and sounds more like a bell than a blade. I will stay here. It is enough my hearing shall be punished with what happens, against which there is no deafening, but to hear, not taint mine eye with dread sights it may shun. Uh, sir, my good lord, your sister will go no further. Oh, she must. She shall see deeds of honor in their kind which sometimes show well penciled. Nature now shall make and act the story, the belief both sealed with eye and ear. You must be present. You are the victor's mead, the price and garland to crown the question's title. Pardon me. If I were there, I'll wink. You must be there. This trial as twere the night, and you the only star to shine. I am extinct. There is but envy in that light which shows one the other, darkness, which ever was the dam of horror, who does stand accursed of many mortal millions, may now, by casting her black mantle over both that neither could find the other, get herself some part of a good name, and many a murderer set off whereto she's guilty. You must go. In faith, I will not. Right, the knights must kindle their valor at your eye. Know of this war, you are the treasure and must needs be by to give the service pay. Sir, pardon me. The title of a kingdom may be tried out of itself. Well, well then, at your pleasure. Those that remain with you could wish their office to any of their enemies. Farewell, sister. I am like to know your husband for yourself by some small start of time. He whom the gods do of the two know best, I pray them he may be made your lot. Our sight is gently visaged, yet his eye is like an engine bent or a sharp weapon in a soft sheath. Mercy and manly courage are bedfellows in his visage. 
Palamon has a most menacing aspect. His brow is graved and seems to bury what it frowns on. Yet sometimes, it is not so, but alters to the quality of his thoughts. Long time his eye will dwell upon his object. Melancholy becomes him nobly. So does Arsite's mirth. But Palamon's sadness is a kind of mirth, so mingled as if mirth did make him sad and sadness merry. Those dark humors that stick misbecomingly on others, on him live in fair dwelling. Hark. Oh, how yon spurns to spirit to incite the princes to their proof, our sight to the spoiling of his figure. Oh, what pity enough for such a chance. If I were there, I might do hurt, for they would glance their eyes towards my seat and in that motion might omit a ward or forfeit an offense which craved that very time. It is much better that I am not there. Oh, better never born than minister to such harm. What is the chance? The cries of Palamon. Then he is one. Twas ever likely he looked all grace and success, and he is doubtless the primest of men. I pray thee run and tell me how it goes. Still Palamon. Run and inquire. Poor servant, I was lost. Upon my right side, I still wore thy picture. Palamon's on my left. Why so? I know not. I had no end in to end in in else. Chance would have it so. On the sinister side of the heart's lies. Palamon had the best boating chance. <laughs> this burst of clamor is sure the end of the combat. They said that Palamon had Arcite's body within an inch of the pyramid, and the cry was general a Palamon, but anon. The assistants made a brave redemption, and the two bold titlers at this instant are hand to hand at it. Were they metamorphosed both into one? Why? There were no women worth so composed a man. Their single share, their nobleness, per peculiar to them, gives them prejudice of disparity, value, shortness to any lady breathing. More exalting. Palamon still? Nay, now the sound is our sight. Thee, lay attention to the cry and set both thine ears to the business. The cry is Arsite and victory. Hark, Arsite, victory! The combat's consummation is proclaimed by the wind instruments. Half sight saw that Arsite was known babe. God's lid, his richness and costliness of spirit looked through him. It could no more be hid in him than fire and flax, than humble banks go to law with waters that drift winds forced to raging. I did think good Palamon would miscarry, yet I knew not why I did think so. Hmm. Our reasons are not prophets when oft our fancies are. They are coming off. Alas, poor Palamon. <laughs> So, where our sister is in expectation, yet quaking and unsettled. Fair Semele, the gods by their divine arbitrament have given you this night. He is a good one, as ever, struck at head. Give me your hands. Receive you her, you him. Be plighted with a love that grows as you decay. Emily, to buy you I have lost what's dearest to me, save what is bought. And yet I purchase cheaply as I do rate your value. Oh, love, sister, he speaks now of as brave a knight as e'er did spur a noble steed. Surely the gods would have him die a bachelor, lest his race should show in the world too godlike. 
His behavior so charmed me that methought Alcides was to him a sow of lead. If I could praise each part of him to, to the all I have spoke, your arsight did not lose by it. For he that was thus good encountered yet his better. I have heard two emulous Philomels beat the ear of the night with their contentious throats. Now one the higher, and on the other, then again the first, and by and by outbreasted that the sense could not be judged between them. So, so it fared good space between these kinsmen, till heavens did make hardly one the winner. Wear the garland with joy that you have won. For the subdued, give them our present justice, since I know their lives but pinch them. Let it here be done. The scene's not for our seeing. Go we hence, right joyful, with some sorrow. Arm your prize. I know you will not lose her. Hippolyta, I see one eye of yours conceives a tear, the which it will deliver. Is this winning? Oh, all you heavenly powers, where is your mercy? But that your wills have said it must be so and charge me to live to comfort this unfriended, this miserable prince that cuts away a life more worthy from him than all women. I should and would die too. Infinite pity that four such eyes should be so fixed on one that two must needs be blind for it. So it is. There's many a man alive that hath outlived the love of the people, yea, in the selfsame state stands many a father with his child. Some comfort we have by so considering. We expire, and not without men's pity, to live still, have their good wishes. We prevent the loathsome misery of age, beguile the gout and rheum that in lag hours attend for gray approachers. We come towards the gods, young and unwrapped, not halting under crimes, many and stale, that sure shall please the gods sooner than such to give us nectar with them, for we are more clear spirits. My dear kinsmen, whose lives for this poor comfort are laid down, you have sold them too, too cheap. What ending could be of more content? Or as the victors have fortune, whose title is as momentary as to the death, us is certain. A grain of honor, they do not or weigh us. Let us bid farewell, and with our patience, anger, tottering fortune, who at her certain streels. Come, Come. Who, begins? who begins? Even he that led you to this banquet shall taste to you all. Ah. Uh, Ah, my friend, my friend, your gentle daughter gave me freedom once. You'll see it done now forever. Pray, how does she? I heard she was not well. Her kind of ill gave me some sorrow. Sir, she's well restored and to be married shortly. Oh, by my short life, I am most glad on it. Tis the latest thing I shall be glad of. Pretty, tell her so. Uh, commend me to her, and to peace her portion, tender her this. Nay, let's be offer us all. Is it a maid? Uh, barely, I think so. A right good creature, more to me deserving than I can quite or speak of. Mm -hmm. Commend us to her. her. The gods requite you all and make her thankful. Adieu, and let my life be now as short as my leave-taking. Lead, courageous cousin. We'll follow cheerfully. We'll follow cheerfully. On! Say! Oh! 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 Hold! Ho! Oh, it is a cursed haste you made if you have done so quickly. Noble Palamon, the gods will show their glory in a life that thou art yet to lead. Can that be? When Venus, I have said, is false, how do things fare? Arise, great sir, and give thy the tidings ear. They are most dearly sweet and bitter. What hath waked us from our dream? Uh, listen, then. 
your cousin mounted upon a steed that Emily did first bestow on him, a uh, black one, owing not a hair worth of white, which some say will weaken his price, and many will not buy his goodness with this note, which superstition here finds allowance on that horse is our sight. Trotting the stones of Athens, which the Calkins did rather tell them and trample, for the horse would make his length a mile, if it please his rider, to put pride in him. As he thus went counting the flinty pavement, dancing as twere to the music of his own hooves made, for as they say from iron came music's origin, what in this flint cold as old Saturn, and like him possessed with fire malevolent, darted a spark. Oh, what fierce sulfur else to this end made, I comment not. The hot horse, hot as fire, took toy at this and fell to what disorder his powers could give his will. Bounds, comes on end, forgets school doing, being there and trained of any kind of manager, pig like he whines as of sharp rowel, which he frets at rather than any jot obeys, seeks all foul means of boisterous and rough jadery to deceit his lord that kept it bravely, which not served, when neither curb would crack, girth break, nor differing plunges, disroot his rider whence he grew, but that he kept him between his legs on his hind hooves. On end he stands, that our sight's legs, being higher than his head, seems with a strange art to hang. His victor's wreath even then fell off his head, and presently backward the jade comes over, and with his full poise becomes the rider's load. Yet is he living, but such a vessel tis that floats, but for the surge that next approaches. <laughs> he, he, he much desires to have some speech with you. Lo, he appears. Oh, miserable end of our alliance. The gods are mighty, our sight. If thy heart, thy worthy manly heart be yet unbroken, give me thy last words. I am Palamon, one that yet loves thee dying. Take Amelia, and with her all the world's joy. Reach thy, thy hand. Farewell. I have told my last hour. I was false, yet never treacherous. Forgive me, cousin, one kiss from fair Amelia. Tis done. Take her, I die. Thy brave soul seek Elysium. Close thine eyes, Prince. Blessed souls be with thee. Thou art a right good man, and while I live this day, I give to tears. And I to honor. This place first you fought. Even very here I sundered you. Acknowledge to the gods our thanks that you are living. His part is played, and though it were too short, he did it well. Your day is lengthened, and the blissful dew of heaven does arouse you. The powerful Venus well hath graced her altar and given you your love. Our master Mars has vouched his oracle, and to our sight gave the grace of the contention so the deities have showed true justice. Bear this hence. Oh, cousin, that we should things desire which do cost us the loss of our desire, that not could buy dear love, but loss of dear love. Never fortune did play a subtler game. The conquered triumphs, victor has the loss. Yet in the passage, the gods have been most equal. Palamon, your kinsman hath confessed the right of the lady did lie in you, for you first saw her and even then proclaimed your fancy. He restored her as your stolen jewel and desired your spirit to send him hence to heaven, hence forgiven. The gods my justice take from my hand and they themselves become the executioners. Lead your lady off 
and call your lovers from the stage of death whom I adopt my friends. A day or two let us look sadly and give grace unto the funeral of our sight, in whose end the visages of bridegrooms will put on and smile with Palamon, for whom an hour but one hour since I was dearly sorry as glad of our sight, and am now as glad as for him sorry. O oh, you heavenly charmers, what things you make of us. For what we lack, we laugh. For what we have, are sorry. Still our children in some kind. Let us be thankful for that which is. And with you lead dispute that are above our question. Let's go off and bear us like the time. I would now ask you how you like the play. But as it is with schoolboys, cannot say. I am cruel, fearful. Pray yet, stay a while and let me look upon ye. No man smile, and it goes hard, I see. He that has loved a young handsome wench then, show his face, to strange if none be here. If he will, against his conscience, let him hiss and kill our market. Tis in vain I see to stay ye. Have it the worst can come then. Now, what say ye? And yet mistake me not, I am not bold, for we have no such cause. With the tale we have told, for tis no other, any way content ye, for to that honest purpose it was meant ye, we have our end. And ye shall have ere long, I dare say, many a better to prolong your old loves to us. We, and all our might, rest at your service. Gentlemen, good night. All right, come on back, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for this reading of The Two Noble Kinsmen. Now, we are getting near the end. We have just two readings left before we complete the canon. Next week is Shakespeare's shortest play, The Comedy of Errors, followed up by our final reading, which, of course, will be Hamlet. So come back and join us the next two Saturdays as we finish out the canon. Thanks, everybody. Good night.